Welcome to the Like Build Podcast. This is John Faithful Hamer. Today we're going to be talking again with a repeat guest. You, many of you have sent me very kind messages about this guest, um, philosopher Patrick Lee Miller. And this particular episode is going to be cross-listed. <laughs> it's going to be, uh, it's obviously it's an episode of Like Build, but it's also going to be an episode of Patrick's new podcast. So, Patrick, welcome. Thank you very much right. for having me back. So uh, why don't you tell our listeners, I mean, they've heard you before, but tell uh, them a little bit about yourself and about what we're going to be talking about today. Well, I am a philosopher. I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I teach philosophy at Duquesne University. And uh, I got a degree at McGill, which brings me back here. I'm, so far, it's been not every summer, but it's becoming a tradition to come back and see my college friends here in Montreal. And, and joining the Likeville podcast is a special treat. Awesome. All right. So you had a, a like sort of an introductory remarks to sort of frame our discussion. So okay, shoot. Yeah. So I uh, host the Living Wisdom podcast, which is yet to be released. It'll be coming out this fall. And the idea of that podcast, at least in its first season, is that I'm focusing on the show Black Mirror and uh, philosophy. And the idea is to use Black Mirror to illustrate philosophical ideas, but also to use philosophical ideas to deepen the experience of watching Black Mirror. And with each episode, I usually give two philosophical monologues beforehand, and then I have a dialogue with somebody about a particular episode. So in this case, we're going to be talking about Archangel today, and the monologue that will be released before this comes out on my podcast is about Freud, Marcus Aurelius, and Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff's book, The Coddling of the American Mind, which I, I yeah. know you know very well. In fact, I think you've hosted... Uh, Jonathan Hyde, yeah, Jonathan on your, has been a on guest on yeah. about that book, actually. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So what I typically do in my, the dialogue portion of my podcast is I summarize the monologue that I've given. So if somebody had heard that a couple weeks ago, they'll be refreshed. Or if somebody hasn't heard it at all, they'll at least just have some orientation to the philosophical ideas that are in the background of the way I approach this episode. Perfect. So let me just spend five to ten minutes just summarizing uh, the ideas that I focus on from those three authors. And the theme of those three authors that I pull out is on trauma and safety. So first, Freud. Um, Freud distinguishes early in his career between the pleasure principle and the reality principle. The pleasure principle is fundamental. Human beings, he thinks, are pleasure-pursuing organisms. All animals are, but humans in this case. And yet, we're not constantly seeking what's most pleasurable in the instant because we develop, in contact with reality, a recognition that the world doesn't give us pleasure immediately. We have to be clever about it. So we develop what he calls the, the reality principle. And so humans uh, fail sometimes to achieve pleasure because they're heeding the reality principle, but ultimately what they're trying to do is to achieve pleasure. So even though humans are not generally happy, he thinks, they're trying to be happy. They're just making a lot of mistakes along the way. However, later in his career, and this is 1920, when he writes a book called Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he thinks that's not a sufficient explanation of human happiness, that we need to understand humans not just as being bad at pursuing pleasure, but pursuing something else besides pleasure. And at the end of that treatise, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he thinks we're pursuing death. There's something in us called the death drive. And I touch on that briefly in my monologue, but I, I probably won't summarize it in this part of the, the summary. So what is it that starts him down that road towards the death drive? He talks about something called the repetition compulsion. That is that there is something in us that simply wants to repeat. Now, we could have understood it as we engage in repetitive behavior because we're trying to master something. We we're trying to achieve pleasure, we meet reality, it's not giving us what, what we want, and so we start practicing and, and repeating an activity in order to get pleasure. And the repetition compulsion, as he calls it, like having the same dream every night, for example, or you know, having tics and so on, that could be an effort to achieve pleasure that fails. That would have been faithful to his earlier conception. But in this 1920 work, he thinks, no, we've got a repetition compulsion for the sake of repetition. There's something in us that simply wants to repeat, and that's where he goes down the road of the, the death drive. The other idea that I talk about in that monologue is that he thinks we have a psychic skin. It's a metaphor, of course, but if you think of our psyche as, as a thing and the external world as a thing, there's, there's a barrier between them. He calls it the psychic skin. Stimuli come in from the external world, and we can accept them or repel them. And if uh, you know, they're difficult when we accept them, we have to process them. But if they're difficult and overwhelming, they can rupture the psychic skin. And then our defenses, if you like, are helpless against this negative stimulus that comes from the outside world, it comes into us. And then he thinks that repetition compulsion gets engaged. Ultimately, he thinks the death drive. But 
when we have traumatic experiences that rupture our psychic skin, he thinks that can initiate this repetition compulsion. And that's why you get the patients such as he observed after the First World War who had suffered trauma in the trenches and then had these repetitive dreams about the horrors that they'd experienced. He understood that as that traumatic experience ruptured their psychic skin. They weren't able to process it in the regular way, and their psyche got derailed into a repetition of uh, just simply reliving that experience over and over again. So that's his theory of trauma. Skip ahead now from Freud to Jonathan Haidt and the book The Coddling of the American Mind. I make in my monologue a just quick summary of that first chapter where he uses Taleb's distinction between fragile, anti-fragile, and resilient. Fragile things, as you know, uh, when, uh, can be broken, and then when they're broken, they're ruined, so we have to be careful and protect them. Resilient things, on the other hand, don't break, so easily, like a rubber ball as opposed to a teacup. But in the middle is the interesting thing, the anti-fragile. Anti-fragile things can be broken, but they can mend themselves. And when they're mended, they're stronger than they were before. So the immune system is a good example of something that's anti-fragile. You don't want to treat the immune system as something fragile. He uses the example of peanut allergies. You don't want to keep children, at least in his understanding, isolated from peanuts because then their immune system won't develop the right antibodies or whatever they need to uh, handle those uh, stimuli in later life. So you expose them to peanuts. They might have a bit of a reaction, but they develop uh, a strength against that. And that would be treating them as anti-fragile. And the complaint, as you know, in that book is that college students, but youth more generally, he thinks, in the United States, perhaps more broadly in the Western world, are being treated as if they're fragile, when in fact they're anti-fragile. And he calls this the culture of safetyism. And he and his co-author, uh, Greg Lukianoff, think uh, the, the right way to treat uh, problems, mental problems, emotional problems, is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which in their understanding involves uh, titrated exposures to difficult things, but also thinking about things in the right way, developing mental habits to handle negative emotional stimuli. And, and as a result, you need to be exposed to the negative stimulus, and then you need to think about it in the right way to master it. That idea goes back to the ancient Stoics, as you know. And in fact, Jonathan Haidt is quite explicit about that. He keeps, as I mentioned in my monologue, he keeps Marcus Aurelius on his bedside uh, stand. I think I heard that first in, yeah, in, your, in yeah. your interview with him. So that idea from uh, cognitive behavioral therapy stems quite explicitly from Stoicism. Not just that Haidt uses Stoicism, but I think the founder of cognitive behavioral therapy saw himself as being inspired by Stoicism as well. So in my monologue, I, I just talk about the, the basics of Stoicism, that the fundamental distinction is between the self and, the, and God, or at least that's the best way to get at, I think, that philosophy. And what is it that makes us who we are? It's our reason or our judgment, because that's the only thing over which we have total sufficient control. The emotions are simply judgments. So they, they think the emotions are part of us as well, because when you get angry, you're making a judgment that you've been insulted. That's ultimately the emotions are a judgment. Now, when the bad things happen to you in the world, you shouldn't feel that they're happening to you if you thought something bad was happening to you in the world, such as your reputation was ruined. You shouldn't, if you're a good Stoic, think of that as happening to you because that hasn't affected your judgment. That's affected your reputation, which is outside of you. The only threat to you is a corruption of your judgment. And since that's something over which you have total control, you need not worry about uh, the world. Now, Going through life and having your reputation ruined, having your uh, friends die, having all kinds of misfortunes happen, misfortunes happen to you is, of course, very difficult. But if you exercise the right way of thinking about these things, which is where you can see the CBT coming, if you develop the right mental habits, uh, you'll be able to handle it. So the Stoics should see obstacles as an invitation to growth. The flaw that I talk about at the end of my monologue, or at least the flaw of the use of Stoicism in the present context by people like Haidt is that for the Stoics, when apparently bad things happen to you in your life or happen in the world, you also have the confidence that God, it's God. God's supervising everything. In fact, God is everything. The Stoics think of God and the cosmos as the same thing. So part of their mental exercise, the spiritual exercise of being a Stoic, is seeing the world as divine so that even when apparently bad things happen, they're in fact good. Yeah. That's, of course, missing from the 21st century use of Stoicism or the 20th century use of Stoicism in cognitive behavioral therapy. The other problem uh, that I mention 
is that Haidt wants to treat humans, in this case the youth of America, as anti-fragile. And of course, for many things, they're right. So I, I agree with them on most of the substantive uh, cases that they discuss. You know, when a feminist speaker comes to Brown and debates another feminist speaker about whether rape culture is a real thing in, in, in the United States, I don't think that there need to be safe rooms where people can go once they've heard those ideas and, and, and color with crayons and, and pet puppies and that kind of thing. I think that if that is a bad idea, of course, that's debatable. If that's a bad idea, they need to be exposed to that, and they need to learn to think about it in the right way. So I think roughly CBT is the, a good way to think about what's going on there. But there are real dangers in the world that can destroy you. So there's a difference between seeing humans as always anti-fragile versus seeing humans as anti-fragile for some things and fragile for other things. And that I think that kind of gets eclipsed in their discussion. I don't think they recognize that, at least for some people coming into college, some experiences will deal with them as if they it will, will, will result for them as if they were fragile. And, and here I want to recall the Freud. <clears throat> if they've experienced trauma in their life, let's say sexual trauma, which is often the locus of this debate, then it could be that seeing images, for example, of rape or even having certain kinds of discussions about rape could initiate in them uh, repetitive behaviors, you know, images that are upsetting to them, uh, destabilizing to them emotionally because their psychic skin was ruptured earlier on. In other words, some people will go in and they'll hear those discussions, they'll see those images. They, those are negative stimuli, of course. Let's say if it's a discussion or a viewing of a rape in a movie, they'll be able to process those negative stimuli. But if that's assuming that the person has, in Freud's terms, an intact psychic skin. But if the psychic skin has been ruptured, then those same stimuli that would leave somebody else able to have a rational discussion about that will leave somebody else unable to have a rational discussion. They'll be re-traumatized, we would say. So I think that distinction from Freud is useful and, and should be interjected into that debate that Haidt and, and is having with with other thinkers. So, so much for a summary of my monologue. Now I, for the purpose of my podcast, will introduce uh, my uh, interlocutor for this discussion. That's John Faithful Hamer, who is a teacher of philosophy at John Abbott College here in Montreal. This is, I think, the only episode of my podcast where I won't be in my dining room. I'll be, um, in this case, I'm up here in Montreal. And John Faithful Hamer is the host of the Likeville podcast, a very successful podcast. I encourage all of my listeners to listen to as well, and I know many of them have. And in fact, I think my producer, uh, Perry Ganchuk, whom I, I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, on on air for the first time, he discovered me first through, I think, the Likeville podcast. Oh, he heard fantastic. the Likeville podcast. Fantastic. He's a, a media specialist at the University of Pittsburgh, and he heard that interview. He wanted to start a career producing podcasts, and so he thought, hey, I'll, I'll call this guy up down at Duquesne in Pittsburgh, and he invited, <laughs> me, he invited me to have my own podcast. Yeah, perfect. So thank you very much for coming on my podcast as well as having awesome. me on yours. <laughs> well, I, the first thing I would say is, just in your your so your monologue in your introduction the the implications of Taleb's notion of anti-fragility are are even more intense than than perhaps somebody might get the impression of of just reading uh the coddling of the american mind because what he says you know as you said there's the three different kinds of things there's fragile things um robust things and anti-fragile things and a robust thing uh, as you said it's 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 very tough, like a boulder or something like that. It doesn't change very much at all. Um, and it's it's kind of, it can maintain its present form or present shape uh, quite well, but it, it doesn't evolve. It just kind of breaks down over time. But something that is anti-fragile, it's not just that it benefits from stress to a certain point. And Taleb is very clear about that, that anti-fragility is, is always... Um, that there's a positive kind of post-traumatic growth to a point. I see. If the stress is too much, yeah. it'll flatten you. Right. It can do permanent damage, yeah. and you won't necessarily come back. So he, he never says uh, in an unqualified way that whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Good. No, lots of things can mess you up so much that you don't ever re come back to a full yes. strength. But the other implication, which is just as important for Taleb, is that things that are anti-fragile, and he says most living things are anti-fragile, not only do they benefit from stress, they are harmed by the absence of right. stress. Yes. And that's really important. So it's not as if like you're saying, do I want my kids to be safe 
or do I want to expose them to some stresses so that they'll be stronger? Yeah. It's that you are actively making them weaker right. when you don't allow them to be subjected to certain kinds of stress. Right. They're deteriorating in the same way that uh, if, if people go into a space station, and this was a big problem at first, and they, uh, they don't have the stress of gravity on them, uh, they will, their bones will start to demineralize. Right. They'll get, and you had astronauts at first when they realized this, who were in peak health, you know, like 31 years old kind of thing, and they would be up there for a while. They would come back down and would, would trip mm. on, there's one guy famous, he tripped on a stair, fell on the ground, and his leg broke in three places. Mm. Like, a, like an old lady with osteoporosis. Yeah. yeah. You know, like just bird, like bones. And likewise, I'm sure if you've had somebody uh, who's had a bad accident or some sort of operation where they were laid out in recovery in a hospital, for your muscles atrophy very quickly yeah. and deteriorate if you don't use them. So for Taleb, it's, it's not just that you're depriving your kids of strength. It's that you're actively harming them right. when you have them in a you know, bubble-wrapped so there's no neutral decision when it comes it's to not parenting. Neutral. You it's can't not, it's you not can't not think, well, I'm I'm neither harming nor helping by keeping them at home and and having them watch kids' movies. It's that you're actually harming them. Yeah. Well, I mean, because the thing is, is like a lot of people hear his idea of anti fragility and they imagine that uh, letting your kids go out and have have adventures and get into outside of their comfort zone and stuff like that, they think of it as like, well, that's that's like giving them extra lessons in, you know, Chinese right. or right. piano. And like, right. it's, I can either do that or I can just be easier on them and just let them like hang out or something. But he would say it's, you're actively harming. It's not a neutral decision at that's all. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good clarification. Yeah. My complaint, and I'd be happy if you, it turned out that you know these thinkers better than I do and you can answer it, but my complaint isn't about that or, the, or that notion. It's about the way in which Haidt and Lukianoff apply it to college students as if they all college students have the same nature. They're all, let's say, anti-fragile, and then we could be sophisticated. They're anti-fragile about these things and not about these things. Instead of thinking college students are of different sorts. Some have been traumatized, some haven't. The ones who haven't are in these conversations that we're talking about are going to be anti-fragile. The ones who aren't are going to be fragile. Then it becomes a question of, do they belong in the conversation? If they can't participate in the conversation, they simply get excluded from that conversation. Obviously, there's a big cultural movement about inclusivity, and so that, that sounds even bad to say that. You have to include them. And then if you do include them, what accommodations do you make? And I, and I guess the, the complaint is that if you make too many accommodations, you're not, in fact, having the conversation. Now you're, you're, you're treating them as if everybody, as if they're fragile, and you're harming the people who are anti-fragile by treating them as if they're fragile in the way that you're talking yeah. about here because like the astronauts they're not being stressed enough yeah well one of my one of my favorite this has been playing out on on this facebook group that i'm a part of there's uh, one of my favorite podcasts is the ologies podcast with uh, which is hosted by ali ward it's an absolutely delightful podcast each week she interviews a different uh, which she calls ologist and it's like she'll do like an entomologist or oh, herpetologist wow. yeah. or like uh, all these like really like astronomers and like all these scientists. It's like a different scientist yeah. each week. And it's very uh, it's at a really high level. It's really fantastic. So there's a Facebook page for the Ologies podcast. And the people who um, the people who moderate it, they're they're wonderful. Um, but I'm seeing this whole kind of drama that that they talk about in the coddling of the american mind play out in this group because they value safety and inclusivity above all else right. and so they would have people complaining uh that i'm afraid of spiders so can you not <laughs> post any this is a fucking science podcast can you not post any pictures with spiders because it traumatizes me right. and then other people were like can you not show any pictures of snakes can you not show any pictures? Of, and the list just keeps going on right, and on of right, all the things right, that are banned in right, the group right. because it's traumatizing. And there's been a couple of times where there's been just outbursts where people have said, this is fucking ridiculous. Like, what do you, this is a science page. And you're saying we're not allowed to show pictures of like bugs and pictures of disorders and pictures of like, yeah. like, yeah. and, and then they, they get 
dogpiled by people saying like we're just trying to be inclusive right and we're just trying to be like, there's a conversation ender if someone says they're being inclusive and you're on the other side yeah it's over and, and you've lost say, well we're trying to be sensitive to people yeah. and we want to be nice and stuff like that and i i i get that and i definitely think that being compassionate and kind is is a good thing it's like a virtue absolutely but it has to be balanced with other things and if you're in the context of like a, a science podcast or, or a university classroom, the search for truth and the, those things in that context take precedence over a lot of other things. Yeah, it doesn't mean that they, they trump the the need to be kind and to be as as gentle as possible, but it means that that virtue of being gentle and kind and compassionate is not going to be paramount. Yeah, and it's not going to trump right. the other ones. That's but a good. That's a good point. The university, there's a special mission, namely the pursuit of truth, that yeah. one doesn't have in, in a, co- a coffee shop conversation necessarily. There are different standards, uh, different rules as a result. Yeah. Let's let's t- let's look at the episode. See yep. if we can illustrate this in a particular case. So one that comes to my mind is when the archangel implant. I think has been first installed, or at least the mother Marie is her name. Well, why is thinking don't we give about like it. just like a, a yeah. brief synopsis? Why don't of you? The show, I know the, that you uh, teach it so often, so why don't well, you give you, us? Well, you do too. No, 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 please. You. Uh, well, the, in the Archangel episode, um, the, there's a, a mother, single mother, and she has a little daughter, and her daughter gets lost in the park. It's sort of every parent's worst nightmare. Don't you feel it? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I feel I, it every time I watched it. I actually that felt episode. like I was going to puke when yeah. I, the first time. Not the second time or any other, but the first time I watched it when the kid is lost, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, I was It's only totally, happened to me totally... twice and just completely innocuous. Like somebody, I was in a gym and they were sitting while I was working out and then one of the attendants in the gym took them to the bathroom and I, I came to check on them. They weren't there. It was only five minutes and of course it was a totally safe environment as a private gym, but yeah, exactly. I just... You just feel like the entire world collapses down. You can't think about anything else. Yeah. It's so you're so it's such a terror. And it's also it's such a weird mix of feelings because it's like terror and horror and all that stuff. But also you just think this is like the most important thing that I'm supposed to do in the whole world. And Nothing I failed. I, yeah. And I just like fucked <laughs> this up. Like, yeah. like this it's is true. like, you know, caring for your young. Right. Like right. You're supposed to like shepherd them to uh, – and I've just I've dropped the ball on the most important thing. Well, let's yeah, it's I horrible. Mean, I, right? I don't want to interrupt your summary. No, no, you sure, can continue, sure. but yeah. think about when the child gets lost on that playground. Really, the mother's only taken her eyes off the child for at most thirty seconds, a minute, yeah. two minutes, perhaps. She's having a conversation with another mother, and that's how quickly something like that can happen. So yeah. you know, just to that feeling, maybe I'm just assuaging my own guilt. To that feeling that you failed to take care of your young. The alternative would be you have your eyes on them 24 hours a day. <laughs> you, yeah. you never sleep. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an impossible standard. You know? It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. So the, the kid sort of gets lost, and the mother is absolutely panicked. And so when eventually the, the kid is actually is found, and it's set a couple of decades in the future. And there's this technology called the Archangel technology where they will implant a chip in your kid's head. Painlessly. And it's totally painless, and it will allow you to uh, not only monitor your kid um, at all time, at all times, which some parents already do that with their kids' cell phones. Right. They put like GPS trackers, and they right. they can look at it. And so, you know, I have students who tell me that their parents will, you know, call them up and say like, uh, you know, mm. I. Are you in this? Oh, I'm sleeping at my girlfriend Susie's house. I'm like, really? <laughs> on, on the map, you're like, uh, you're 10 kilometers away from that. Right. It suspiciously looks like your boyfriend's house, actually. Yeah. Uh, but they can already, already parents have right. that. But in this future technology, um, it also permits you to control what your child sees. So mm-hmm. you can actually, in the, in the way that you might put on like, you know, porn or violence like controls on their computers so that they can't go to certain sites that show certain kinds of graphic content you can actually make it impossible for their eyes to see and to process any kind of violent content that it'll be pixelated out yeah it'll be blurred out and it's it's automated so that the system monitors the child's cortisol levels to measure their stress and so if they see a violent image blood it automatically pixelates once you put that setting on it automatically pixelates that part of the visual field so they don't see 
the blood. Yeah. And you get on top of that, you get this sort of iPad looking thing where you can see what your child sees. That's right. So if the kid's in the kitchen and trying to steal a cookie from the cookie jar, <laughs> they say, what are you doing? You're like, oh, nothing. <laughs> you can see. Right. Just one. <laughs> yeah, you can see like the, that scene where like she's yeah. she says, just one. She can yeah. see. So you have the, uh, the omniscient power of, of a god. You can yeah. see everything. You can... It's the panopticon. See, yeah, you can see inside, like there's, like you said, there's stress levels. Like it also measures, you know, everything. Like oh, you know, her her iron is low. That's you know, right. she needs more selenium. Maybe right. buy some broccoli or something. Like, and as becomes important in the <laughs> show, it also finds out when you're pregnant. Yeah, so it's you have this incredible power of of surveillance, which within the context of the show, you you understand why because she's a single mother because of this horrible experience yeah. the temptation to use that technology would be uh would be quite strong but of course well you can tell us what it doesn't work out so well <laughs> like, so how does it yeah so the the scene that i was thinking of in reference to what we were talking about earlier is when uh, it's either been installed or it's just about to be installed and S sarah no a marie the mother is pushing sarah on the swing in the backyard and the grandfather of the child, Sarah's, uh, Marie's father, Sarah's grandfather, is standing next to her. And Marie is describing the technology and, and says, but it's free. And the grandfather says, oh, free. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and, and I forget the segue, but you know, he's obviously skeptical about this technology. And um, he says, well, I let you go out and play without any kind of supervision. And, and she says, yeah, you didn't put the baby gate up, and I broke my arm. And he says, well, how's that arm now? Which is the point about anti-fragility. <laughs> Namely, she's recovered. Yeah. And then she, she raises her arm with the finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, letting, letting kind of them have some, some accidents and stuff like that, make you more careful. Yeah, it's... I mean, there's some, there's all sorts of very, very insane scenes in that show, like where she can actually turn on the, the thing when she's a teenager and she sees her daughter like, having sex, having sex, <laughs> yeah. and, like doing cocaine, <laughs> doing cocaine, you know, doing all these things. So, it's, yeah, it really sort of goes to a lot of the coddling and surveillance culture that we already have. I mean, like I, I was mentioning to you just before we we got on that. Uh, Yesterday, I found it out. This is a friend of ours who moved down from here down to Texas uh, with their sons. This school that her sons are at in high school, so they are these are sixteen year olds, um, they're twins, and the school where they're going in Texas, it's part of the policy is the school, the teachers, the school administrators, at any point, they can ask you for your cell phone. These these kids. Uh, ask them for their cell phone, and they need to open it up and give all the passwords to all social media accounts. Yeah. And they c they can read all of your emails, text messages, and if you don't show it, you can be uh, suspended or expelled. Right. And you absolutely have this. And so they, there's this surveillance culture, and they also say that not only they're afraid of like online you know, cyberbullying and right. things like that, if you're a member of a group, like let's say you and like 20 other of your sort of classmates are a member of some Facebook group or an Instagram or you know, whatever, um, and there's somebody on there who's saying like off color jokes and saying like or saying like racist jokes and comments and things like that. If you not only is that person in trouble, everybody who's a member of mm -hmm. that group. Who didn't snitch? Who didn't say yeah. something? They are equally in trouble. Yes, and right. can be kicked out of school oh, wow. for not. So it, it just, it absolutely, it's terrifying. It's like creating this, yes, yeah, snitch culture. It's also just this creating a culture where you're under surveillance all the time, um, and you are expected to kind of you know, rat out. So there's absolutely no privacy. There's no spaces where peers can hang out. And and talk freely in a way that they wouldn't 
what they were yeah. if they were talking with other people for yeah. like there's no spaces like that right so in our childhood we would have just gone out and gone on into park montreal and said whatever we want and but now kids are being kept inside and you know, I, I see this with my own kids i would love it if they would go out and play in the forest but no other kids are playing in the forest <laughs> and we'd have to arrange it with other parents and drop them off at the forest and all wait and so on so that's just not happening so they interact online and as a result this surveillance culture becomes possible it wouldn't have even been possible in in our time yeah i mean it's already going pretty far but what what's shocking to me about it is that uh you you, you go back to like puritan new england for instance right and in the massachusetts bay colony they had laws forbidding people from putting curtains or any kind of coverings uh, on their windows right. and it was because they said that you needed to permit holy watching mm -hmm. right so it was it was required that nobody have any covering over the windows and you yeah. had to have a certain amount of windows on each house yeah. and your neighbors would come around and they were supposed to be able to come in and look in on what you're doing at any time. Yeah. Right. And that's even in your bedroom and everything they need to be able yeah. to. Yeah. And the way that we maintain the godly society is by everybody feeling like being they watched. are being watched. Yeah, all that, the that's time. the panopticon right. right there. Yeah. And it's, and that's supposed to, and then, you know, this is also, I've seen this same motif in, I, I've done a lot of studies like cults, right? Yeah. Very, very common thing in cults is everybody uh, is required to keep a diary mm. and the leader or the leaders of the cult will read that diary mm. all the time mm. so that you are supposed to be kind of transparent to them and all your yes. most, your deepest secrets and things like that. And of course, totalitarianism uh, societies do do that sort of thing as well, right? Yeah. So it's it does it raises all these these crazy questions. I mean, one of the questions that I, I ask students in uh, in my love and friendship class is I I say, you know, should your partner have your passwords? Like, should they have? Uh, should, and you know it's it's very fascinating because it it kind of gets to a lot of this stuff, right? So she, I, I I have a colleague, a, a former colleague, I'll say, who um, has a common email account with his wife, and I'm not close to this colleague, so I don't know the reasoning, but I, I assume it's something like this: that if we have private email accounts, then we might have affairs through our private email. So the fact that we have a common email account is going to be one bulwark against that temptation. Yeah. My thought was, if you don't trust each other enough to have <laughs> private email accounts, then there's got to be something wrong in the marriage. Yeah. Well, there's I mean there's so many things I think wrong with that. But uh, but one of them that is is often overlooked is that if you have a like a a joint email account with your partner, you should notify absolutely everybody that you True. know that, because when yeah. people are sending you a message Right. It's like when you call somebody and they put you on speakerphone in a room full of people, and you're like, "I thought I was talking with you, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm speaking in a way that I think I'm talking to you, right? I wouldn't speak this way if I knew there were like four other people listening, right? And that that I think really annoys a lot of people when they you have a couple like we share everything. <laughs> well, great, you know you can do that, but like you should let everybody else know because you're you're True. unilaterally making a decision for yeah. everybody else yeah. to know. Yeah. Right? It's, we thought a lot about this, as I recall. I've seen a lot of posts from you on your social media accounts about sharing private correspondence. Maybe this happened to yeah, you. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's happened to a lot of people I know. It's it hasn't happened to me, um, well yet. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> never happened to me, but it's happened to um, to a lot of people I know, and it, it strikes me as as a very very dangerous thing. To, it's very corrosive. Mm -hmm. I mean, where I've seen it the most is in activist circles mm. where you'll have somebody who, uh, one person in mind I'm thinking of who's really, really bad on this, um, who she's a very kind of notorious Montreal activist, and she would have all these kind of online co uh, correspondence with different people in that community. And then if she would turn on somebody, she would like go and – like look mm. over mm. like two years of correspondence with this person off and on and would screenshot uh, things yeah. that it's could terrible. be that yeah. could be taken out of context and could make the person look bad and then just like publicize this everywhere yeah, and terrible. say this person you yeah. know she's terrible because she and it, it was just very very bad I mean like because especially in activist circles I mean I would say in general just in friendship in general we have to be able to trust each other. Like we have to be able to have faith in each other. And it seems like a lot of these technologies are an attempt 
to get around this basic problem of the human social condition, mm -hmm. which is that you can never really see inside somebody's heart. You can never really know what somebody really feels about you. So you have to take people on their word. But a lot of people don't. They, they can't do that, right? They, they want, like, I want proof, Certainty, yeah. Right? It's like God in the book of Job. He's like this insecure guy. He's like, well, maybe he just likes you for your, like, <laughs> your stuff. And so it's like, you put, I'll put you through all these tests to right. try and prove to me that you love yeah, me. Yeah. Prove to me. And, but this surveillance kind of gets around all of that, right? Did, did you ever watch the movie? It's um, it's based on Howard Hughes. It's with Leonardo DiCaprio. I did see that The one. Aviator? I did, yes. Yeah, well, I don't remember it that well. I mean, I remember the obsessional episodes. <laughs> the yeah. The, well, well in, um, in The Aviator, one of the things, which is completely true, this actually happened, is uh, he was on and off again with Catherine Hepburn for mm. quite a while. And he was incredibly rich and quite paranoid and he had a small army of private investigators mm. that had mm. like bugged her phones mm. had bugged her house yeah. followed her around yeah. and would give him like reports and it's and you know here he had like you know 15 women going at once he had different like concubines all over the place but he was obsessed with her not right. seeing anybody else. Well, it's good for the gander. It's not necessarily good for the goose. Yeah, and like, and but he he had her under constant surveillance because he didn't. Uh, and he one time she finds out about this and she's furious and she confronts him, and he says, uh, "Well, you know, I don't listen to all the tapes of your phone calls. I just read the transcripts because <laughs> <laughs> I trust you." Yeah, because he, like he thinks this this is like I'm you know I'm pretty yeah. moderate, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, we have. We, we have transcripts of everything now because so much of our interactions happen by text or by, you know, there's there's a, a record of almost everything now. Yeah. And I mean, I also like my students have told me this, that you I, I think it's probably the same in the States. But here in Canada, if you have a, a cell phone plan for the price of ten dollars, you can call up the cell phone uh, company and say, can I have a transcript? every single message that has gone in and out of this phone and they'll mail it to you. It'll oh arrive God. like a day or two later for cool. $10. And so these uh, students have told me situations where their parents and they've been like exchanging oh messages God. with yeah. their girlfriend or right. their boyfriend and like right. really private messages, yeah. you know, sexting and all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. And maybe kind of complaining about their parents or complaining about like, right. and they have like, chapter they can get a transcript of all of that yeah, yeah. right it is just insane right yeah. and a lot of jobs now also um, require that you give uh, them access to all of your private i've heard about it. i mean i see this on twitter emails. people saying i'm going to shut down this account because for the next two months i'm applying for jobs yeah so it's creating a very very strange strange world but i mean sort of circling back to, to archangel a little bit how do you think the the daughter sort of suffers because of this yeah. overprotection? Well, I was thinking about this in the last few minutes that, I mean, she suffers in so many ways, but the, the way that's really standing out to me now is that she doesn't feel that her mother trusts her. And I think for a child growing up, they have to feel to some extent that their parents trust them. Something's missing. If they're, if they're just being, if they're being monitored all the time as if they were the devil, there's going to be, I think, a self-fulfilling prophecy there. Well, that's that's the way they're seeing me. I think children, to some extent, take on the identities. I, I say, to some extent, take on the identities of what their parents project onto them. So, by not trusting your children, you're projecting onto them this, I'll, you know, you you'll do anything when I'm not looking. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a amount of self-fulfillment to that. I suspect. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is. I remember when. Uh, when Tristan and Andy were, were younger. Those are your boys. Uh, yeah, they're 16 and 17 now. And uh, when they were younger, the question we got from a lot of parents is, so what are you doing about um, internet? Are you, yeah. do you have parental controls yeah. on your internet and stuff like that? And our service is like, no, we don't have any parental controls. We mm -hmm. don't monitor mm -hmm. their, their internet mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, we've sort of, made clear you know what is uh, what is appropriate and what's not mm -hmm. and they they know that and uh but 
it's up to them, you know, if they, you know, whatever they want to look at, that's yeah. their their business. I suspect that's unusual these days. My kids are not quite, they're getting to that age. I'm starting to have to think about this question, but you're, you're farther along the line in, in parenting than I am. Did you find that that was unusual, that you were the exception? Um, anytime the question came up, uh, we were always on the on the very kind of permissive side of it. Yeah. Um, but... But we never had any problem. I mean, we very is it, much... Isn't your son in the military now? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's at flight school for the summer, the 17-year-old. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, the idea with permissive, you know, the cliche is that, oh, well, the, you know, their kids grow up to be dissolute drug addicts and so on. Your son has gone the other extreme, and I assume he's got a military discipline. He's well, yeah, he's in kid out. But for him, it's more that uh, he, he says that, well, you know, if you got in a time machine and talked to people a thousand years ago and we're telling them about the 21st century... Uh, I'm sure most people would be like, uh, wait a minute, you can fly like a bird? <laughs> He's like, I don't understand why anybody would not, like, yeah, t- t- send me, sign me up for the yeah, flying like yeah. a bird part of yeah, the 21st yeah. century. So he doesn't understand why. He's like, I don't understand why everybody doesn't want to fly. Like Every kid does, especially uh, little boys, and right, well, I give up that dream. He's, he's flying now. He's yeah. flown solo at 17. So he's, for him. he's a flying license before driver's license. But um, – no, we we also we had this when they were young. They live about uh, about a mile from school, and they walk to and from school um, by themselves. Great. Can I just and, p- yeah. interrupt you there? Yeah. Because I I, th- I think a lot about that particular question. So, like you, no doubt, I walked you know a mile or two to school as well. Starting from, I'm remembering second grade, which means, you know, I was like seven, six years old. I guess that'd be seven, eight, eight in second grade. And my son's nine. I, don't, I wouldn't let him walk a mile or two to school. And so I guess I'm part of the safetyism culture as compared with being raised in the 70s. But one thing I think about is I have a friend in, in Pittsburgh. His brother died at 10 because he was walking to school and got hit by a car when he crossed the intersection. Uh, I'm not sure whether he made a mistake or not. But uh, this gets to the point about anti-fragility and fragility, that we are fragile when it comes to being hit by cars. Mm-hmm. We Especially are. when you're short and you're like not really coming up to their eye level with the drivers. like. And yet we are anti-fragile in the sense that we need to be trusted with tasks like navigating to a place in order to acquire that skill. And if we're constantly coddled and put on buses and taxis and, and shepherded around by our parents, we don't develop that skill. As you said earlier in clarifying Taleb, we, it's like the osteoporosis. We diminish. So I want my son t- to gain those skills, but at the same time, I'm haunted by that story. And the culture has shifted so that we're more haunted than we want the skills, I think. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason. I'm sure it has a lot to do with media and scares. You know, of course, the, s- certainly since the 90s, it seems like the television programs, the news and so on, really highlight terrible things that happen. And there's a craving for that among the audience. And then it becomes this vicious cycle that, you know, that gets the ratings, so they do it more. And then people hear it more and they get more scared and so on, you know, certainly with the missing children thing that uh, really seemed to take off in the in the 80s and, and, and the 90s. Because kids are safer now than they've ever been, as far as I know, from the statistics oh, yeah, that I've seen. Absolutely. But we're more worried about them than, you know, our parents, you, you and I, our parents mm-hmm. were uh, being raised in the 70s. I mean, the stuff that we got away with in the 70s yeah, that, that, we would never, that we would never do now. So it's it's easy for me when I see Archangel to think, oh, that's terrible. You shouldn't have these implants. You know, look, obviously what she's missing. Here are all these philosophical reasons why this is a bad idea. But then again, I'm haunted by that particular story and, and others that are less severe. Yeah. Well, I mean, I same thing. I was walking I was walking about a mile to, to school when I was in grade one. Uh, from then, I was walking to and from and uh yeah i remember i very clearly remember being terrified sometimes like because i remember um the first the first it was like grade one and i was like i just because i was like september 29th so i the cutoff was october 1st so, so i was you always the youngest kid in the okay. class like I, my birthday would come last yeah, yeah. so i was five when i started grade one Wow, that and, is young. Yeah. yeah, and and so I was walking to to and from school by myself, and I remember when the days started to get shorter. Yeah, and I would when I would leave in the morning, it would be dark. Yeah, it was night. Amazing. Like there were yeah. stars and like the moon up, and I was walking to school because you know days get very short in the winter here. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, I remember a couple times being like absolutely terrified. Oh, you were scared. Okay. And uh, I mean, I got over it. I yeah. got to school and it was yeah. fine. But yeah. but I also there were some bad experiences. Like I got really bullied mm. by this kid. Oh God, Ricky. <laughs> I still but, remember like, his yeah, name. Yeah, I remember. But he was like an older kid, and he would he would kind of figure out what my route was, and I would oh, try and dear. change my route, and he would find it, oh, and then dear. just like uh, you know to slap me around, kick me, and knock me down like mess me up and this kid was like significantly older right, than me right like he was I, he he must have been like i was a little kid and he was in grade six grade seven he was way older yeah, like it was just yeah. weird the kid with problems obviously. but uh but yeah that wouldn't have happened if i was getting sort of ferried in yeah. a in an suv back and forth you know right. but but i also learned i learned lots of good skills i learned how to how to deal with bullies how right to how to learn. block a haymaker <laughs> how, yeah, like it, it, so I, I was a good it was a, a good thing I mean, one thing i've noticed just when when tristan and indy were were younger we go down to the states very often because we have a lot of family down there and friends down there and when especially at family gatherings when tristan and indy were younger they were very kind of wary of adults they didn't know and they were sort of like like wild animals or like cats. They sort of like mm. they would really kind of, and s so if they were expected to be really kind of affectionate with people that mm. they basically don't know, mm. they see them like once a year, once every couple mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. and they're expected to go and hug them and kiss them, and they they just were like totally not mm -hmm. okay with that, mm -hmm. and they were not like very very um, kind of affectionate and friendly, and so we would take some uh, amount of flack from from family members down there they'd be like what's wrong with your kids they're not mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. being polite in there i'm like what do you mean they're not being they're not being rude they're just not sort of meeting your emotional needs and kind <laughs> of coming and kissing you that did just, they attribute it to being canadian because uh, americans do no we we told them we told them that I th look they walk to school in a in a heavily urban area mm -hmm. they're walking mm -hmm. over junkies and mm -hmm. squeegee kids and like you know homeless people yeah. and, and drugs they're they're walking around they are because of the environment that they live in and that's not just walking to school that's going to the park they are wary of strangers which is actually a very good thing to right. be right and they're very aware if you see them like walking the street, mm -hmm. they're very aware of their surroundings and they're not like zoning out because they don't want to get hit by a car or yeah. they want to like right. right so they're they're aware of their surroundings it's gonna help being a pilot uh right and that, that's actually a really good thing whereas i I find that the the kids who are very sheltered, they can sometimes be really, really not street smart. Like they're not, uh, they're not paying attention to potential dangers. Mm -hmm. They're really kind of naive, mm -hmm. and so they can be they can get into bad situations. I mean, obviously, bad things can happen to anybody, but it's far more likely yeah. if you've been in this really sheltered environment where you just. Uh, expect everything to be okay all so, the time. So, I mean, in the episode, when there's a crisis that we can describe in a moment, and the mother, Marie, recognizes, on the advice of a psychologist, she needs to shut down this unit. And then she tells Sarah that morning, I'm going to turn it off. No Archangel today. And, you know, it's funny. I, at the time, I think almost every time I've watched it, have thought from Sarah's perspective that she's afraid. But now that we've had this conversation, I'm thinking she might be happy. Wow, mom trusts me. And I, I don't know, I'd be interested in, in your reaction. But just to finish this thought, she walks out the door and has to walk by that dog that uh, is symbolic of minor threats, I think, because the dog is on a leash and, be, and behind a chain link fence. She gets scared because for the first time she's seeing the dog since she was a baby because the dog has always been pixelated out by this unit because of the cortisol levels. She gets scared and backs up into the street, and a truck nearly hits her and yells, hey, kid, watch out. And this is an instance where if she'd walked by the dog every day and had learned to tolerate the fact that there's a barking dog, after all, he's behind a fence, there's not, nothing to fear, she wouldn't be so skittish, she wouldn't jump into the road. She's very naive. Yeah. Things. And she could easily have been hit by a car if that guy hadn't swerved. So that it's it, it does become a self-fulfilling prophecy, too, that, well, you need the Archangel unit because, look, this would have happened. And yet that wouldn't have happened if she hadn't had the Archangel unit in the first place because she would have just kept walking straight. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of terrible because, I mean, as you say, you do you need, do need to let your kids be exposed to dangers and threats. But the, 
the downside of that is that something bad can it's a happen. real yeah right? it's, it's just a constant judgment call i think i just find it as a as a parent and this uh this episode really highlights that is a constant judgment call of how much danger to subject them to and uh, you know again the taleb point if you go with zero tolerance you're actually harming your kid if you're completely permissive well, I, I suspect that's too dangerous, although I hear about cultures where kids are handling knives at three and they're, they're just fine, although some apparently lose fingers, but overall it's better for everybody. But yeah, we've got to find somewhere in between, and there's no rule, and you have to constantly judge. Yeah, Is this you're, you're, what I'm going to allow? You're absolutely, absolutely right, because I, I think about it even just with like my two kids, it was different for both of them. Mm. And so our attitude was like, we're not going to have a one-size-fits-all yeah. approach. If, if one of them is is takes... You know, longer to to try things yes. and is more wary. We're gonna we're gonna go with that. Yeah. We're not gonna say, well, your your brother yeah. was able to stay at a sleepover right. at this age. Why can't you? Yeah. Why are you? Well, then of course yeah. they say it's not fair because this one went. <laughs> yeah, I'm constantly dealing with this. My son, he wants everything to be fair. He's nine and my daughter is six, and I tried to explain to him, but she's two and a half years younger than you, so everything the same is not in fact fair it gets to questions of justice actually yeah, what is no. it what is equality actually yeah. it's not straightforward but but i think part of it is because i've seen the opposite thing and uh, is where people want to like toughen up their kids and they're mm -hmm. like yes you know free range kids and we're going to be tough yeah. and they go in the other direction where they're they're almost like doing like the the fervor method you know like let them cry it out and let them yeah. like, yeah. like i'll throw you in the deep end yeah and i'll do that stuff and i, I think that's like equally yeah like misguided no I, I know someone who's raised by the ferber method all oh, this was in the 70s so i don't know that it had that name at the time but this was a, a kid who at the time cried uh in you know when put alone in a room for bedtime just cried and screamed and has distinct memories of the parents leaving and learning later that what the parents did was just turn up the tv and ignore it and this person who's now in the 40s remembers being traumatized by that and still feels abandonment anxiety, and that becomes the screen memory for abandonment anxiety. So uh, this person wasn't toughened up by that experience. Yeah. The person was traumatized. Well, I mean, w the message you get from that is that the people that I most depend upon yeah. are unreliable. Right. Like, they're not going to be there. And so our, our strategy, which it, it paradoxically some, some parents we knew thought that this was sort of coddling, I just thought... It was reasonable mammalian behavior, but we, when they were young, they were allowed to like if they had if scared in the middle of the night, they could come and like crawl into bed with us when yeah. they were little, and that was like totally okay. Mm -hmm. Anytime you want, uh, you start off in your room, mm -hmm. but if you're having a rough night, you can like come, that's okay. You have a home base if if need be. And then when they first went for sleepovers and stuff like that, uh, I remember there's one of my sons said was kind of really scared about it. And he said, like, if I get scared, can can I call you and will you come and get me? Uh -huh. Right. And uh, and I said, yeah, absolutely. And they, one of the other parents, the other dad, he's like, you shouldn't do that. You're just giving them an out. Mm. And uh, an out as if this is a trial. They're going over there to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> I said, he said, <laughs> they well, shouldn't need it. He out. said, if you give them an opportunity, if you give them uh, an out like that, they're going to they're basically just going to exploit it. You have to like let them kind of. Uh -huh. tough yeah. it out and i and i said well you know that's you do you uh, yeah i i think it's far more likely that he's not gonna take advantage yeah. of the out um it, but having the security that uh yeah my my mom and dad will will come and yeah. help me if i need it just knowing that the safety net is there will actually make yeah. him more daring. Sounds to me like you made the right call like there. Like, be more daring because yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, that's interesting that that uh, if the whole point is to make kids more daring, sometimes being more coddling makes them more daring. Yeah. It gives them the feeling that there's a safety net so I can be, I can explore more. Yeah, well, right. this is what, uh, what Andrew Yang was saying when he was on uh, Joe Rogan. He said, people say that, like, having a universal basic income mm. is going to lead to, like, uh, stagnation right. Laziness, in the society. Yeah. It's going to be really really bad he goes that's simply not true he mm -hmm. said the one you know many many studies of entrepreneurs have shown that the one of the biggest reasons why entrepreneurs tend to come from wealthier backgrounds yeah. or a lot of them come from places like finland sweden stuff like that they can take risks you would you would think that it's because they've got all this money behind the project and things like that mm -hmm. actually no it's usually because they've got 
they they've got that safety net that they yeah. that they can they know that if, if if things go terribly it's not going to be the end of the world they have a, a safety net so having that safety net actually makes me people more likely to take risks yeah. and start a new business yeah. or try out this idea yeah. because they, so he said this will increase um, entrepreneurship yeah. it won't uh, decrease it so but. does this um, call into question do you think this trichotomy between fragile anti-fragile and robust or resilient because it sounds like I mean the, the, the height story is and, and perhaps the Taleb as well is that if you coddle them you're treating them as if they're fragile and so they won't grow whereas here it's let's not call it coddling let's be more general but and maybe we just call it coddling for the moment to use the same vocabulary if you coddle them if you say to my kid you've got an out when you go to the sleepover instead of uh, freezing them in a developmental stage, it allows them to take risks, whether they're ar- entrepreneurs or their or children going to sleepovers. Is that? I mean, I'm well, thinking you, on I the mean, fly you're here. Very, that... You're very familiar because uh, I've heard you talk about it elsewhere. But at- attachment theory, right? Yes. Like, and attachment theory. Yes. When they looked at these kids, these war orphans and things like that, yes. and then the monkeys, they find that there's kind of three different like attachment styles, right? So the the kids that are left to cry in their room yeah. and are le- and are they have one of two responses. They either grow up to be incredibly clingy people who, as soon as somebody, mm. they have any intimacy with somebody, they just overwhelm the person yeah. by yeah. just like, yes. like you know, really crazy, so, yeah. right? Like they have, because they, they I got to hold on to your leg because yeah. you're going to leave if I yeah. don't. And yeah. I need to kind of people in a relationship, they text you like 30 times a day and like, they're very, very needy and clingy, and that's uh, from that's one response to that. Yes, kind of, uh, and then the second one is that you, the kid, on a some deep, deep emotional level, yes. realizes that I can't count on people. Right. All I can count on is myself, and uh, so I need to uh, really kind of have a kind of uh, like I have to have a kind of a independence i can't rely on anybody and so whenever they feel themselves starting to need somebody and rely on them mm-hmm. they respond by putting up walls to try and distance themselves from the person because yeah. i know you're going to let me down yeah. and so i have to right yeah and then so th- those are the two kind of unhealthy attachments insecure styles. attachments yeah. call and then the the healthy attachment style is where the people that mattered most were there you for me. knew they yeah. had your back like right. no matter what right right and they were going to be there for you no matter what and that actually paradoxically makes you more likely to be adventurous yes. and to be willing to explore because you know if if at any time something goes wrong, yeah. they're going to be yeah. there to help you. You mentioned the word autarkia. I don't want to lose that. I want to come back to that. Yeah. So don't let me forget that. But but let me just go back to my question. If you don't have an answer, fine, because I don't have one yet either. But, but, but I feel like I have an instinct that um, this thought that we're developing, that uh, being coddled, so to speak, makes you more adventurous. Does that call into question that trichotomy. In other words, are Taleb and, and, and Haidt working with too simple a story when they think if you're coddled, you're being treated as fragile, and as a result, you don't grow. Here we've got you're coddled, you're being treated as fragile, if you like, and as a result, you grow. Well, I guess it, it has to do with the how much freedom and how much danger you're allowed to do. Like I think about, uh, I don't know if you've ever come upon like a like a bear and a bear cub in the woods. No, no. Like, have like, you? Yeah. Oh, good um, for you. And it's it's really interesting because the the mother bear, like she's just doing her thing. She's uh-huh. foraging. She's like going around, and she'll let her cub or cubs go pretty far. Yes. And they will go and kind of explore. And the cubs can sometimes you know be as much as like like a half a kilometer away, kind of exploring and doing stuff like that. But if they have any kind of distress, if yes. they like hurt themselves mm-hmm. or if they fall uh-huh. down like a little cliff or if they yeah. see a human yeah. and they yell out a shout, mom yeah. comes like barreling and yes. you better get away if you're right. between her and her yes. cub. And so the, the cubs explore and they're allowed to sort of, but it's always like within. So it's not as if she's like micromanaging them yes. and, and watching them putting like yes. elbow pads and knee pads right. and like, you right. know, like, bubble wrapping them and say, oh don't touch that oh my yeah, god you might yeah, you might yeah, get yeah. like she lets them kind of explore openly and, and do things yes right? but there's always the the idea that you do have right? yes. so i don't know i guess you could you could say that's like slightly coddling but coddling i imagine more these 
parents who just like hover yes around their kids and it's uh it's definitely you know in terms of in heterosexual relationships it seems to me like it's often gendered like it's not always gendered but in this way but it usually seems like it's the mom that uh is is more kind of like oh don't oh my god oh. like it's just really really kind of not wanting and yes. and usually the dad is the one who's kind of saying oh come on let her let her do that let her try that and let her a little bit more i have been in many situations where the dad when he's got a private moment rolls his eyes about that kind of behavior it's sort of he sees his job as managing his wife's attempt you know overwhelming attention to the child Overall, yeah and it's, i agree with you it's, it's but i think generally speaking what i've seen in in dual parent homes and i've actually seen this with uh with with gay couples as well that have kids with lesbian couples that have kids it's it's amazing to me that even in in that situation, one person seems to naturally take up the role yeah. of being the one who's kind of. It's almost like this innate human desire for balance, right? And to find balance in in partnerships. And I think that happens generally in in couples that people yeah. take on roles and then so they actually go them, to extremes. One of the moms will yeah. be the one who's like saying, "Oh, come on, let her go to the park by herself." Yes. It's not, and the other one will be the more coddling one. Right. And then the two of them together mm -hmm. will find a kind of a balance, right? And in, in heterosexual couples, it, in my experience, you know, 90% of the time, let's say, it's the, the father who's pushing for them to have more adventure and the mom yeah. is, is coddling. Yeah. And together they find, uh, they find like a nice, a nice kind of a happy medium, ideally. Yeah. So I think one of the things that about Archangel that's really important as a show is that it's a single mother. Yes, right? uh, you mentioned and that. And so I, it's I a single mother, so you don't have a – I mean, she's ha she has her dad around, sort of, but he's just a, a grandfather, so he doesn't really have any big say. He can roll his eyes and say that's silly, but that's right. he doesn't have the, the kind he's of not making the decisions. power to like yeah. say, like, no, it's my kid too, and I'm not cool with right. how far you're going on this. So what you have is, a, is to some extent, a situation where – uh, it, it's almost like an argument for dual parenting that episode to some extent that when you have only one side of the parental spectrum yes and that is indulged completely yes right it it creates something that is no, a maybe point. not yeah. like ideal right yeah in yeah. the same way that if you have uh you know like a single father like i remember a couple people that i, I mean it was rare but a couple people that i knew growing up who had like just their dads the dad was just kind of absent and not really paying attention most of the time and they were just getting into all sorts of trouble uh -huh. and getting in and you know and trying to get dad's attention too by causing trouble right yeah so it's that that's not ideal either yeah. right you know i had so many thoughts in the last few minutes uh, one is this book by allison Gopnik. it's probably 10 years old by now i think it is exactly 10 years old called the philosophical baby and uh, she makes well, she's got all kinds of um, experimental evidence for this, but I think she puts it in an evolutionary context as well, that adults and children have fundamentally different approaches to the world in this sense. The, the adults have to attend to reality, and uh, for obvious reasons, and protect the children, and that frees up the children to explore because their brains are growing so rapidly, the more they explore, the more their brains are going to grow. I mean, not the brain itself, but they're going to make more connections. They're going to they're learn faster. And you need those two, because if you don't have the parents to do the protection, then the child can't be liberated to explore as much. I'm not sure where I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure where I'm going. I mean, I guess I was thinking, having that thought when you were talking about the couples, namely, you've got to have, whether it's one parent or two, you've got to have that structure in place so that the kids feel safe. I guess I'm coming back to that point we were making about attachment theory, that the kids feel safe to do the exploration. If they don't feel safe, then they can't do the exploration. They have to kind of take on parenthood or, or adulthood too early. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, their growth gets stunted. And I, I've seen this. You, you get people who grow up, and they, they grow up prematurely in a way. They take on adult roles when they're young. I remember seeing this in, in when I went to university, that some people just seem very mature. And yet I found, to scratch the surface, it's a kind of superficial maturity that they've acquired because they didn't have a secure attachment you get under it, and you realize, well, they didn't actually do a lot of the exploration. They don't feel comfortable exploring mm -hmm. with ideas, for example. They need <coughs> things to be a certain way as a result. Yeah, there's – I think it's in um, her book or another – it was like 
it was talking about different parenting styles and like sort of the stereotypical like working class parenting style, middle class parenting hmm. style, and different things like that. And I can't remember it's uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in one of his one of his books, um, and he says that the when he interviewed kids that had grown up in kind of working class where they were kind of left on their own uh, a great deal at the age of like let's say kind of 10 years old 12 years old 13 years old they seem much more mature than the kind of like bourgeois kids bourgeois kids seem really kind of immature like, mm-hmm. like <laughs> yeah. everything and then but when you go forward yes. to when they're kind of 18 19 20 uh-huh. it's completely the opposite the kids who were much more didn't have as much um, kind of concerted cultivation those they seem young yes. and kind of immature yes. and sort of not even kind of silly and the kids who were kind of, uh, more i guess to some extent coddled or had like much more protection around yes. them yes and um, they sort of are blossomed into yes. adults and they yes. seem like much much more mature yes it's a, it's a weird it's so very complicated i mean we all want our kids to grow up to be as mature as they, i mean every parent wants that and you've got to make, as we talked earlier, you've got to make these fine-grained, infinite decisions all the time about so many different things, but along these different axes we've been talking about, protection, freedom, supervision, ignoring them, and so on, with the idea that I'm putting them in the environment where they can do the exploration. Yeah. And yet, it, it, well, it's obviously easy to go wrong, and things go wrong dramatically in, in this episode. Yeah, no, it, it's – but it also – I see a lot of parallels to teaching because uh-huh. – because when you – if you have an idea of – you have, like, an ideology of some kind, right? You have an ideology of how you should parent, right? Well, and then that ideology maybe is informed or not informed by your personality, by, like, what you're, you're like, right? Well, then, if you get a kid that is is sort of going to be – that's going to that work well for that kid, then that might be great. But if it's incompatible, if your mm. kid it needs a different kind of parenting and a different kind of situation, yeah. right? Then that's yeah, you know, that's going to be a disaster, right? Right. And then the same thing happens with with teaching. You know, when I uh, when I talk to like people who have just been been hired and they're kind of they're learning mm-hmm. all this the ropes and they'll tell me this big ideology that they have about how they teaching believe in, philosophy. They believe yes. in the democratic classroom, or they believe in like you know things like this. And the so what I tell them is like you're gonna have to be open to what the students actually are, mm-hmm. right? So if they don't fit, or if this doesn't fit your teaching, if mm-hmm. there's like if it's discordant, you're gonna ring hollow, inauthentic. It's not gonna work. Yeah. Right. So if you are, uh, let's say, if you are by nature kind of a, more of a, an authoritarian kind of bossy pants, mm-hmm. and you're trying, I've seen this a number of times. People who are like very progressive out of like graduate school and they're like, I believe in the democratic classroom <laughs> and all this stuff. But you talk to them for 10 minutes and you realize you have a very authoritarian nature. Uh-huh. <clears throat> You're kind of a bossy pet. <laughs> so, like, if you try and organize a classroom in this way, when you are by nature like this, yeah. it's going to come off as really inauthentic yeah. and it's yeah. not. So, why don't you just go for a more controlled kind of. Uh, disciplined classroom yeah, where it's yeah. like where you're running things and you're the yeah, conductor because yeah. that's who you are yes so like don't do this thing because you're going to come off as a complete fake yes. right like uh, and yeah i mean i think with parenting that's a lot of it too right so if you are like by nature let's say like a very permissive person um and you get a kid that responds well to that then great but what if you get a kid that needs like tons and tons of limits yes right and then having multiple kids it just complicates it because you know what i've heard from so many parents who've had multiple kids is they say <clears throat> you know we tried we we parented this way with the oldest and it worked really great mm-hmm. then we had another kid and we did the same thing didn't work perfect and then we had a third kid and that kid needed totally different kinds of parenting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we had been doing the permissive and I'll let you give you a lot of trust. This kid needed tons of boundaries Mm -hmm. and was, you know, this was a disaster. So having no very few limits and having like, like a lot of trust and privilege, I'm going to let you kind of figure things out with this kid uh, leads to them being 
totally, you know, flunking out of school and getting in trouble with like the police and getting and just being making a lot of very bad decisions. Right. And that's that's in many ways, I think that's just like the tragedy of of parenting, of teaching, of everything. It's that no matter how much you over it's like Machiavelli says in The Prince, right? Like you in order to be successful, you have to not only see things clearly, um, but you have to be lucky. Mm. Like you, you're the strategies that come naturally to you. If you're naturally cautious, naturally mm -hmm. bold, mm -hmm. if you happen to be in a situation where this is what Fortuna has given you, yeah, and your nature accords with the situation, then you'll be successful, right? But it, in our day and age, it's like with parenting or teaching, it's like you end up in these situations where you don't have perfect knowledge of what is required, and so it's tragic, right? Because you don't know if it's going to work. So many things to say, John. So, <laughs> I mean, first of all, I'll just quickly say that I'm so glad that I had my second kid for many, many reasons. But one of them is that if I'd only had my first kid, and you know, all kids have problems. So I'll speak about my first kid's problems, not because they're extraordinary, but <clears throat> this is a fact of life. I would have blamed myself, <laughs> just my nature. And then when I had my second kid, and we raised her the same way, as far as I can tell, those problems weren't there. Not to say she didn't have other problems, but... I, I really saw in a visceral way they have their natures. And I think as parents, we're there to kind of guide them, keep them from broken bones. And, and, and part, of, part of this discussion is, and you can't even do that. And if you try yeah. too hard to do that, you're actually going to harm them. So I'll take that back. That's something I've been saying for years, keep them from broken bones. But I guess yeah. I've been betraying the, the archangel insight. You're there, to, I think, to do not very much, you know, to give them that protective environment in which they can do the exploration and recognize that they're going to be exploring in their own ways. You know, the, the uniqueness of, of the children, that's something I learned the hard way, let's say, from, from having a second kid. Now, when I apply it to teaching, my thought was, yes, I've, I've known that all along with teaching because we, you know, we get 100 students every semester or whatever. And the, the more you get to know, the more you realize some just gravitate to your style and they just eat it up. They're like yeah. waiting for this all their life. Others can't stand you and you could be locked in a room with them for a thousand <laughs> years and they would never learn anything from you. They're just <clears throat> incompatible types of people. Yeah. And you talk about Fortuna, and I think that's got to happen in some parenting situations. People who have kids that simply don't match with them, and that's yeah. got to be difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be horrible. Yeah. I mean, I remember um, there was a, a bunch of – it was like a, a men's group that I was a part of years ago. Oh, that's a crazy story. Were itself. you out beating drums in the forest? I, no, but it was the same – it was that inspired uh -huh. kind of thing. It was, it was a, ridiculous. Anyway, but um, one interesting – a couple of interesting things that happened at that group was there was these these fathers there, like a lot of fathers, and they would talk about, um, say stuff that they would never ever say, mm -hmm. you know, in front of their partners, in front of their kids, stuff like that. And and a number of the the guys said uh, that they had <clears throat> that they had adopted um, kids along with having their their own kids, uh -huh. and quite a few of them said, you know, I I I love this kid so much. But I wouldn't recommend adopting. Yeah. And and they said the same. They would have the same sort of thing. They said, "Well, uh, when you have your kid that's biologically yours, and your whatever weird things that come up, you're usually like, oh yeah, he's like my my uncle, you know, yes. my uncle, you know, Bobby, or that's right. that. Oh yeah, that's very like Aunt Sally, and oh we know that kind of you know this kind of anxiety runs in the family, yes. or we know that these." So you, or you, you also say, as I know I've said in my own case, oh, there's my dark side. Yeah, you see, <laughs> I see it manifest, and, and I can so see it better now that it's in another person. And I look back at myself and realize, oh, that's in me too. I didn't see yeah, it quite so clearly. Oh, absolutely. So you can see, if not yourself in the kids, you can see you have this huge data set, which is like your family and and your your partner's family and stuff like that. And you can, when things arise, you you kind of you you can say, oh yes, I I know about that. Uh, whereas they said, like, with an adopted kid... Mm -hmm. uh, you're flying blind. You're flying blind. Like, you really, like, stuff can come up, and you just have no idea mm -hmm. um, how to deal with it. It's You haven't been prepared for that. And, yeah. like, and you can get in situations where it makes the the awesome and difficult job of being a parent, like, that much yeah. harder yeah. when you don't have I've that, seen that, that yeah. kind of... That kind of basic empathy and kind of understanding of like yeah. even if my kids yeah. like even at their worst right. there's uh 
it's There's your worst. They've done. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, that's totally like, yeah. I can be a completely self-centered like rally. Yeah, I can be like, I can shut people out in a way that's like, not healthy at all. And I, I'll see you do things, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I recognize that. So it's, you can, you can do that. Whereas with, with kids that are, uh, you know, and and I know people that have adopted, and they're very, very happy, and it's wonderful, and obviously, but this is a consideration that's. Mm-hmm. Uh, not spoken about it's not spoken about it's not like it's not popular to admit that yeah, right but yeah but very often that's that's in there right yeah 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 oh so uh, some of the other things that i just noted from earlier is you, you talked about uh people come into the classroom with an approach we call that in the field those of you who are listening or not in the field of philosophy or, or or i would think even professors these days these days when you're hired you have to have an explicit written out teaching philosophy and that's considered as part of the application. I was just under the wire. I didn't have to write one of these things. Or if I did, they weren't taken very seriously at that time. I despise these things. Every time I read them, I just think this is horrible uh, because it's a one-size-fit-all approach to the classroom. Yeah. And you come in, and you've got a, a group of students who don't behave that way. You're going to have to adapt. And the, the whole I mean, there's so many problems with teaching philosophies. One of this is, is the problem of hypocrisy that you mentioned, that you're going to have inauthentic mismatches between the personality and there's certain kinds of teaching philosophies that you're not supposed to have so like that authoritarian professor that you mentioned might have been a very good authoritarian professor they're they're good authoritarian professors Fantastic. out there yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you you better not write an authoritarian teaching philosophy that's not you're not going to get <laughs> hired in this field even if the, that, that's the best way yeah. for, for you to teach but then there's also the problem of the one size fits all approach namely probably better i mean imagine uh, going into um, a relationship saying, well, here's my relationship philosophy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no second date for that person. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think actually a lot of people do go into relationships. That's a problem. That yeah. Kind of like yeah. a, that rigid idea of what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's it's always, I always like for this, these kinds of questions, I always end up going back to Machiavelli because I think he lays it out so nicely to say that, you know, we, we do our best. We try and like evaluate what the situation requires and we, and, but, if you're successful, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's like the best strategy because you, you might have lucky. been successful yeah. because you just got lucky yeah. and you actually, it was a dumb idea. Um, or um, you might have been successful because this particular s- s- situation required your strategy. So it was a nice fit. But the problem is like with the whole kind of people then go on after they're successful and write a book and say, Here's this how is to do how, it. Yep. you know, here are my perfect children. And you should all do like uh, there's probably the most egregious example of this I've ever seen is uh, Adele Davis, who was a best selling author in the 1950s, 60s and, and early 70s. She was a, she wrote like parenting manuals. She wrote uh, health books. And they, I mean, she sold millions and millions and millions of copies. It translated all over many different languages. Uh, but one of her books was called Let's Have Healthy Children. And if you find if you find it in a used bookstore, sometime like check it out. She has pictures from different sides of her kids, like showing their profile, showing like how beautiful and perfect they are. And you know, I've created these like perfect kids oh, because dear. of my amazing parenting. Oh, and she gosh. says exactly oh, what you should feed them and how you should do all this stuff. Yeah. And I can, you know, I just imagine Machiavelli laughing at this. Like, <laughs> like you're, you know, you've been successful, great, but how can you be so sure that this is the, the way that's going to apply to everyone? Right? Yeah, you just had a good fit between you yeah. and the and the child. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's tough. Yeah. So maybe we should come back to the episode. We've been away from the episode yeah, yeah, for so sure, long. Sure. Um, although I'm breaking my rule. You mentioned autarkeia, and I said I wanted yeah. to just m- mention that term for those who are listening and aren't familiar. That's a Greek term meaning self-sufficiency. And I didn't know if you had this in mind when you mentioned it's It's considered a virtue in uh, many ancient Greek authors, or if not a virtue, uh, a desirable quality. And in fact, for Aristotle, it becomes a test of the best life. It has to be autarkes, self-sufficient. And, and now I, I've, it's been so long since you mentioned it, I, d- I forget the context. But, um, I mean, I'm wondering if that concept plays any role in your thinking about this episode. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. That part of what you want to uh, – and you, you can't really instill this. They have to learn it uh, through trial and error is this sense of self-sufficiency that I don't know what the future is going to bring, but I know I'm going to be able to handle it. Mm-hmm. Right? I don't know – uh, I don't know what's going to come next, but I'm pretty sure I'll be able to handle it. Like I, because, yeah. and it, 
that is something that can only be learned um, through through trial, trial and, and error and through experience. You can't the whole self esteem movement that somehow you know like I I basically was right at the beginning of the the self esteem when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and so you know my mom to some extent kind of got into that like you're the best. You're a mate. You can do anything. Like she, she got into that a little yeah, bit, you know, yeah. because that's what Mister Rogers was saying and Sesame Street and all that stuff. And I remember as a kid, when I would be like, I don't know, like playing hockey mm-hmm. or doing something, and it it was so obvious to me early, like, wow, that kid's way faster than me. <laughs> like I'm clearly not yeah. the best, yeah. right? And so then it would, uh, then you feel kind of you kind of crushed and you feel disappointed and you don't yeah. want to try because you yes, realize right. people are so much. And so right. it makes much more sense to in, instill in kids or ha- give them the opportunity to develop, to go up against challenges, to fail, uh, and then to try to try again and yeah. to get good at something and to know that they can handle it. Right. Because I've seen, it's funny. I was, um, I was in the car, uh, with this other dad, and we were we were driving um, basically our his daughter and my son down to flight school in uh, mm-hmm. in Saint John. We were driving down, and they uh, both my son and his daughter are super overachieving kids. Like they win like Christmas valedictorian graduation, and they always like get top marks and everything. And one of uh, what his daughter said is, I was saying, so what do you like about cadets, and what do you like about like you know, flight school and all that stuff and she said well it's the it's the first thing i've done where i've had to confront like really real like failure mm-hmm. like i've always been everything's always come pretty easy to me and i do really well in yeah. stuff without trying too hard i get like amazing grades i do in music i'm lsf but this is the first time where i confronted things where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Mm-hmm. Like, and I would just fail. Outright. Kudos to her for not fleeing. I right? would think that's and, a typical reaction. And she in that said, situation. it's just, it's a really amazing experience because there's just no, the kind of stuff you have to do here, there's no f- way of explaining away your failures. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's just you failed because yeah. the thing's not doing what yeah. it's supposed to do at yeah. all. Right. And that's, uh, I don't know if you've ever read um, Matthew Crawford's book, Shop Classes Soulcraft. No. I haven't. Uh, well, he he talks about going from getting a, a PhD in philosophy and yeah. getting a, a tenure track position at a, a university in Virginia. I can't remember which one, but getting that, and then he essentially a couple years in just left after investing all this time yeah. doing graduate school, PhD at the University of Chicago, all yeah. this stuff. Uh, he just dropped out of academia and became a motorcycle repairman. Okay. And he talks about the uh, the differences between the two fields and talks about the trades and yes. everything. And he said, you know, it, it became so abundantly clear to him that in the trades, um, what is different is that you Can I guess? either know something. I was going to say, there's no faking. There's no way. He said yeah. he realized that a lot of like promotion and, and raises and advancement in white collar jobs mm-hmm. is essentially just a popularity contest. Yeah, right. It's just about it because it's very difficult to measure actual productivity. Yeah. And so usually um, the way that you get more status and more advancement is by knowing Promoting how yourself. to yeah. kiss up to the right people and making people like, like you, let's yeah. say, yeah. whereas he says in the, the trades, you have to confront um, the fact that you just don't, know certain things yeah and there's no way to explain it away and you have to confront your own uh neediness and your own vulnerability you have to go humbly to somebody and mm-hmm. say i don't know how to do this i've been working on this motor for an hour mm-hmm. and somebody who knows more than you you have to show them deference mm-hmm. and say i don't know how to do this yeah and you have to be humble and he said, there's just... The uh, machine works or it doesn't. We don't have anything like that in philosophy, do we? Yeah, in- and, and but he said especially, he said the worst uh, by our present kind of education system, he said the, the students that are most harmed by our education system are the high-performing students because they just, they, they go through, they can go through life all the way into their, you know, mid-20s without ever having the experience of total failure 
that mm-hmm. is yours yeah. and cannot yeah. be explained away. Yeah. There's always a way to say, well, the teacher didn't like me mm-hmm. or I didn't like my, or it's because of this, because of that. Like you always have a way of explaining yeah. away your failures. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I think we spoke about that in some of our earlier, yeah. like last summer when we first met, uh, you were reading or he just finished a book called Bullshit Jobs or some, something like oh, that. Oh, David Graeber's book. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. No, he, he talks about that as well. That yeah. there's, Right. So that, that is kind of an – and I think letting your kids fail is really important. Like I – there was a movement when I was uh, – when I was in school. I don't know if it was the same for you down in the States, but where they – Well, I grew up in Canada, remember. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. No, I grew up in th- – yeah. for the listeners of Life of a Podcast, I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, so my Canadian creds are actually better than yours. Awesome. Yeah, they absolutely <laughs> are. But there was the – part of the whole self-esteem thing was they said, well, we don't want kids to fail. Right. And we want them mm. to because it'll hurt their self-esteem. Yeah. And so they had uh, social promotion. Right. If you failed a grade, they would just put you forward because they thought failing a grade is yes. going to be so right. devastating for right. your self-esteem right. that it's better to. Right. So I got promoted by social promotion in grade eight. I actually should have failed the oh, grade because really? I did so terribly. They put me up to grade. But the thing is, is now you're in a situation where you're not prepared for the situation. Mm. It gets worse. It gets worse. Right. And that's. That's actually like probably much worse yes, on your self esteem right. than actually just right. having the experience of failure. Right? But I remember when I first started teaching at John Abbott for a while, they didn't want us to use red pens because they thought that. it was so upsetting. Yes, right. So they gave us pink pens and purple pens. I and, had to use green. Yes, and I they said that. like, "Oh, you should try and say two nice things for every yep. negative thing and all this." And it's just it's so patronizing. Like yeah. it doesn't actually. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't actually work. I mean. But, I found st- students, a few of them, when I'm frank with them, they just love it. Like, it's the first time they've had someone speak frankly about their weaknesses. And yet, there are the majority of the students who still are shocked and are upset and, you know, in the evaluation say, I can't believe he told me I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, just, I had to write a, a self-evaluation. Talk about pr- self-promotion every year, as, as you probably do. I have to write up an evaluation of myself that I submit to my chair and you know, my minuscule raise is based on this. And... Uh, so I have to read all the student evaluations in, in one sitting and then have a stiff drink afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, that's one thing that I, I constantly get is the, the polarization between the students who really like the frank discussion and the majority who are shocked and like, don't think a professor should say something is wrong you know, in a philosophy classroom, that we all have our opinions, and that's the professor's job to really moderate the discussion so that everyone can express themselves. Yeah. No, I, I, I've had, I've had s- very, very similar responses. Like, but, but I just, I sort of set that from the beginning as that's kind of a ground root of the discussion, like yeah. in the first, first couple of classes. So if they, if they find that off putting, they, they'll drop the class. Yeah, I give right. them time. I don't like. Mine's a required off, class. <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, I don't start off as, as kind of Mister Nice Guy and then yeah. turn into, mm-hmm. like, I, I start off as like coming off as kind of gruff and and i'm gonna be really difficult and then soften up afterwards yeah the, the, in the other direction because because yeah. if you do the other way they feel betrayed uh, yeah that's it's like, right i thought you were gonna Bait be the switch. fun uncle yeah right you know give you booze underage right. i thought you were gonna be that guy right right and uh, and then they're like well now you're being like this yeah yeah let me use this as a segue <clears throat> back to the ep- episode because in teaching and i'm sure you're familiar with this i think any professor is you do notice yourself starting to adapt in order to get fewer comments like that and you, you know, if you want to remain true to another way of teaching, you, you have to be disciplined about it. You know, it'd be so, in other words, I think all the time, it would be so easy to please this crowd. If they're like the previous students I've had, here's what I would say in this situation. But I think, is that best for their education? Sometimes it's not. And, and I have to choose between those two. And I think, well, if I were to say the flattering things, or if I were to be less decisive about what's right or wrong in the interpretation of a text, for example, um, I'd be pleasing them, but really I'd be doing it because it would make me feel good. In other words, who's benefiting? What's, what's, why is this happening? So back to the episode, Sarah gets lost on the playground, but really was there, was there any danger? Uh, you know, I mean, there's a train there, so I, I suppose something bad could have happened, but who's really hurt by that? It's Marie, the mother. Mm-hmm. Just like you and I were saying, it's, it's traumatic <coughs> when you lose your kids for five minutes. You, you feel this pain, and you don't want to ever feel that again. And so one thing I think about with reference to this episode, I want you to, to talk about this, is who's the archangel in plant four? Is it for the kids, or is it for the parents? These 
controlling parental styles that we've just fall, fallen into in the last 20 or 30 years, who are they for? They don't seem to be for the kids. Yeah. They're the rationale is there for the kids. We're keeping them from this, that, and the other, which has some truth about it. But it's more, it seems to me, it's more about alleviating parental anxiety. Yeah, I think that's that's sort of a, a, a dirty little secret about parenting that a lot of people don't. You know, the, the discussion of safety in many contexts is very often for the people that are making the rules, not yeah. for the, uh, you know, the not. I mean, you're absolutely right about that. Like the the people who are monitoring their kid on the, the where they're with the GPS and checking their cell phone, like it's for their peace of mind and to yeah. alleviate their own anxiety it's not in the best interest of the of the teenager at all right a similar thing is i remember this uh, this woman who works as a, a lunch monitor part-time she was saying that you know in the packed lunches these parents would put uh, like carrots or put like you know celery inside a little bag and the vast majority of the kids would just throw it out right and they would even when the parents knew that they were going to throw it out mm -hmm. and we're not eating it. They would put it in the lunch all the time. And yeah. I said, why is it? Cause they want to look like they're a good parent to yeah. the other parents. Right. So it's not actually like, I want my kid to eat this stuff. I, I ideally they would, yeah. but they're making these decisions based on other, other considerations, yeah. Yeah. like yeah. wanting to appear uh, like a good parent to other parents. And the safety stuff very much goes into that. People often will get on board yes. with, with the kind of the safety culture and Jonathan Haidt talks about this a great deal they, they get on board because of the peer pressure right so if you're the only one that wants yeah. your kids to walk to school yeah and everybody else doesn't and they're looking at you like a complete degenerate <laughs> because you're doing it that can be a lot of social pressure yeah, to right. to get on board with that yeah right well he talks as i recall about the you know, i think the book begins with this the the thing about the peanut allergies and that uh, this thought came to him when his kids went to school and he was at a parent-teacher meeting before the school year had begun and they were told about the banned peanut items. And it wasn't just, don't allow your kids to bring peanuts. Don't allow your kids to bring anything that's produced in a factory where peanut butter is involved. <laughs> and he stood up in a meeting and said, you know, here are the statistics, here are the studies. And I think he talks about you remember the book better than I will but the social pressure that he received the way in which you know he was especially seen to be not inclusive again it wasn't just that he was a degenerate it was that he had well I guess this is involved it's not just that he was a bad parent it was that he had bad moral values he wasn't an inclusive parent he, was he was he trying to exclude the kids who had peanut allergies <laughs> oh I mean I remember there were a couple of times where because Indy loves peanut butter my younger son and he would uh, make his own own we were trying to get them to be like more independent at a certain point we said you're gonna like you know you're gonna pick your own clothes to wear in the morning and you're going to make your own lunches and stuff like that well indy sometimes he'd be you know half awake and it's the morning and he would just make himself a peanut butter sandwich yeah, right and i remember we got a call and the the sense of urgency and panic you would yeah. think that he went into school with like an ak-47 yeah, with like right. a bag full of ammo like yeah. like it was like he had brought a gun to school or like a bomb yeah. or something like yeah. that he brought a peanut butter like how you, do you know how dangerous this is yeah this is really like you're a horrible person right yeah but of course the the montreal school board has recently said that peanut butter is allowed in schools oh, again they've okay. completely reversed uh, because they've realized that you know as, as Jonathan Hyde talks about um, that peanut allergies have be become much more severe and more widespread yes because of this ban so now everybody yeah. bringing okay. it back that's right? good to hear but but in yeah, Pittsburgh that, it'll be in 25 years we'll catch up the peer pressure up. the peer pressure for that it's just like it can be really really intense so it, it, this is another kind of problem which is that if you want to parent kids in a certain way there has to be kind of a culture and i think it's, yes. it's telling that in the episode the archangel technology is discontinued yes right so clearly a lot of people who thought yes. it was a good idea yes. changed their yes. mind well on that point uh, i mentioned earlier that the the mother puts the unit away for a while you can never remove the implant but you can turn off the ipad that you you mentioned earlier and that happens because the daughter sarah starts harming herself starts uh, poking her finger with a sharp pencil. She tries to draw blood, and this is precipitated by 
Trick, who will later become her boyfriend, calling her a chip head and saying that you know she can't uh, he- see these things uh, on on the video screen that he's showing uh, to everybody. I think it's like a terrorist being beheaded or something. Yeah, or, excuse me, a terrorist beheading somebody. Mm-hmm. And then he tries to show her because she says she's curious, and everything gets filtered out. She can't see it, so she goes home and draws a picture of a bleeding person, and and then even the picture that she's drawing gets filtered out. So she pokes her finger to to draw blood from herself, and then that gets filtered out. Of course, she can, I assume the Archangel Implant's not um, inhibiting the feeling. She feels the pain, uh, which gets to the question of self-harm. I mean, I, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but it's something I do think about, especially in connection with Freud. Freud talks about the difference between primary masochism and secondary masochism. Do we harm ourselves because of a frustrated effort to pursue pleasure? This gets back to what I was saying at the beginning of in my summary of the monologue. Or is it that we actually pursue pain? There's something in us, the death drive, if you like, or the repetition compulsion, that is hungering for that sort of thing. I mean, in that episode, why do you think she's harming herself? Why is she poking herself? I think just uh, my guess is that it, she's harming herself because she wants to um, experience something more vivid and yeah. more kind of awake. And she wants alert. to learn. Yeah. I mean, because I think a lot of people um, who sort of court disaster, I love Tony Hoagland's expression in his poem, Sweet Ruin, you know, people who hail disaster like a cab, you know, <laughs> and very often what they're looking for mm. is is a vivid experience mm-hmm. of, of reality. It's like I remember my grandmother telling me that she said, you know, I know this sounds crazy. She lived through the bombing of, of Britain and she drove an ambulance during World War Two and mm. she had like a lot of friends die. Mm-hmm. Um, like her age, including like the love of her life, was like killed in the war. And, stuff. and, and she, she misses said, that era. And but she said it was like one of the best times right. of my life. My we grandmother had, said the same. We thing. had such a good time because yeah. each day was so rich and yeah. so like full, and you were just so alive. Yes. Right. So I think very often uh, when people are are hurting themselves or kind of going into difficult situations, it's because they just have this this desire to experience something that is more vivid. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and, and that vivid thing can be an unpleasant experience or a really pleasant experience, but it's, uh, they, they want that, right? Yeah. And, and people have, I mean, this is when they talk about like sociopaths and violent criminals and things like that, that it does seem like brains are, are on a spectrum that some people, uh, their arousal, is it mm-hmm. happens very very easily yeah some people have like a very high threshold for arousal and so they they need to go bungee jumping right or you know mountain biking down like a steep hill or, or skiing down a triple black diamond like yeah. they they need these kind of extreme situations to get the same sort of buzz that somebody else might get from watching a horror movie. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I think that Freud's wrong about there being a death drive, and I talk about this more in, in a monologue that will precede this dialogue in, in my podcast. But I think you're right that people who are harming themselves, if there is a general explanation, it's either to learn something or to feel more alive. And the irony is they're not pursuing death. They're pursuing life. They're at least pursuing the, the sensation of life. Yeah. So that well, you, you mentioned that you, uh, you had read recently Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. Yes. Right? Well, I mean, one of the things that I found fascinating in there, which I didn't know before, was that the founder of AA, um, he originally thought that psychedelics should be one of the steps one of the 12 steps wow right and that uh, and and his rationale for it is really quite interesting he said that part of the problem of being being an alcoholic is that you just you come to find the world to be really boring Mm -hmm. and it's it's either painful or it's boring and it's just like it's dull everything's really really tedious and so you have to not only like stop stop the the heavy drinking and stuff like that but you also have to sort of fall in love with the world again yeah and you need to like sort of see the wonder yes. in the world again yes and so he thought that hallucinogenics and that eventually was like turned into higher believe in power. A higher power <laughs> right that some spirituality right. that that replaced it right but originally that was supposed to mm. kind of be that you would ha- not only would you have to stop the drinking and and fix your life and everything yeah. you would need to take uh, some sort of hallucinogenic that would make you uh, find the world interesting again yeah. and beautiful and and awe and that vivid sense of experience, right? Yeah. It's like the the 
you probably watched when we were in our 20s. Remember that movie Drugstore Cowboy with Matt? D- I don't think I ever saw it. Matt Dillon. Uh, yeah. It's it's about these uh, basically the this crew of of druggies who uh, drive around and they they rob pharmacies okay. and they take like all the, all the drugs, right? But the uh, there's this one wonderful monologue in the movie where he talks about why, why like, you know, people who are like real addicts, like why do they keep doing mm-hmm, it? And, mm-hmm. and he goes through these popular theories about why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. And he says, that's such garbage. He said, like, I, most people that I know are like really hardcore addicts. It's, it's not, uh, it, it's not necessarily because they've got some big pain that they're escaping or some abuse mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. like that. It's just, they've been, doing this for so long that without this the world just seems so unbelievably annoying mm. like every sound is every little annoyance dealing mm. with like the you know the waiting in line like just the basic tedium and annoying of life mm-hmm. is overwhelming to them like they find it like yeah they can't deal with it right yeah, so yeah yeah i mean that that's a lot of it but i have i have heard about I mean, it must be from the pollen book that I'm remembering now. Psychedelics as a treatment for addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I, did, I didn't remember the AA part in particular, but uh, uh, you know, now we associate AA with a spiritual solution uh, to, whereas the psychedelics fit into the pharmacological model. Oh, here's an addict. Let's give them this. One of the problems that you know Michael Pollan talks about, but people I know in that psychedelic community say he doesn't talk enough about is the ritual context of psychedelics that they're not just medicines that you just give somebody and then things will be better they have to take place in a ritual context that encourages the spiritual journey or you know the, the going in or the going out as you described yeah. uh, when we talked about this briefly before before the podcast because people I gather in psychedelic uh, trips can get stuck and then that's when it becomes a bad trip that you need somebody there or you need a ritual that keeps you moving forward it can get you out of being stuck so mm-hmm. I, I, sh- I should hope that if those medicines are going to be used, and I'm calling them medicines now, as, as I think people in this community do, plant medicines instead of yeah. drugs, these medicines are going to be used. They're going to be put in some kind of context, set and setting is, is what I've heard. You have to be in the right mindset. And you have to be in the right setting. Yeah. No, it, it's absolutely, absolutely true. I mean, that because there's so much about uh, shaping your perception, it the setting matters a lot in a way that it doesn't for, you know, if you're Cocaine, taking, yeah. yeah, well, if you're taking something that is like really powerful like some opiate or something like that it just shuts you off mm. from everything and mm-hmm. it, it kind of you'll I, I imagine you'll have a similar kind of trip on that regardless of your context which is why you can see people like you know junkies on the street and they're in like they've wet themselves like you right. know, three hours ago they're in dirty clothes mm-hmm. in an uncomfortable position on the sidewalk mm-hmm. and they're completely like oh like yeah. they're Right, they're dead to the world. Yeah, they're dead to the world, and it doesn't. So the clearly the setting doesn't matter much for somebody when they're in that headspace. Yeah. But with hallucinogenics, it, it very much, very much matters. Yeah, right? yeah. But I think part of the you know to, to go back to the episode part yes. part of I think the and Joe Rogan talked about this. It's very very interesting. It's part of the joy and part of the excitement of hallucinogenics is is actually the the kind of the paranoia a little bit for some, it's the the kind of the bad trips or the the threat of of a bad trip so if you are if you are somebody that is basically a very very um emotionally stable person psychologically stable person you you've never really wrestled with any kind of psychosis or anything like that i think uh, part of the the rush that people get from hallucinogenics is that it for a little while, mm-hmm. especially really strong ones like acid or something like that, for a little while it you get a glimpse of mm-hmm. what it would be like to be schizophrenic yeah. or, or to be really and you feel all that rush of emotions and then your your essentially strong psyche, uh, you have an anti fragile response mm-hmm. to that and you find a way to like to be okay in this scary environment. And there's something amazing about that. Yeah, you come down after you feel so much more grounded. Mm-hmm. You're like, I can handle mm. a lot more than I thought, right? Mm. And you know, he, he talks about the the use of psilocybin for people at, at 
in hospice care, yes. like an end of life care. Yes. And how when they do this, they suddenly are not afraid of dying anymore. Right. A lot of them. Yeah. You know, a lot of them. The They're statistic- just not afraid of dying anymore. Yeah. The statistic that impressed me from that book most, and I'll, I'll, I don't remember the precise number, but it was that you know these uh, in the nineties the medicines were administered to a random group of people who agreed to the study. And, you know, these were just people from suburban Baltimore at Hopkins mm. and who had no previous experience with them. And that afterwards, like the next day, the next week, they, I think it was like 70% of them reported, this was the most meaningful experience of my life. But then it was a longitudinal study. Ten years later, they were still saying, at, the, at basically the same rate, it was the most meaningful experience of my life. Yeah. It wasn't like you smoke pot and while you're on it, you feel like this is the most meaningful experience of my life and then the next day you can't remember anything that you, you thought or said. Yeah, <laughs> or you don't <laughs> that, want to. Yeah, that, like... that, that seems so deep at the time. This is a long-lasting change that happens yeah. in these people. They, they get opened to a kind of experience and even if they're not having that experience 10 years later, they remember that they had it and it reorients their life. I gather that's what's going on with the hospice patients is they're they're open to a new perspective a cosmic perspective let's say uh, against which their life i don't want to say seems less important that's certainly not the the point and i don't want to say insignificant or small or anything but that there's a bigger meaning and the death of me and this body at any rate is not as final or, or whatever i don't know what their reports are i can't recall from that part of the book but that that notion of there's a meaning out there, independent of me, that I got access to through these drugs that puts in my life into perspective in such a way that I'm not as afraid. Yeah. Well, it, apparently, I mean, the theory that he says in the book, and I don't know if this is necessarily true, but the, the theory is that when you're in that headspace, you you stop identifying with your your ego. You stop yeah. identifying with you as being this, this I, this collection of adjectives and sort of memories and stuff like yes. that and you identify more just with like consciousness mm-hmm. and with an awareness of your of your surroundings and of beauty and of the world and of all these things and so yes. the the extinguishing of like of you you ceasing to exist doesn't seem like as much of a big deal anymore because you identify with something else yeah or or maybe even nothing you're just you're just it's not such a big deal anymore yeah. like it doesn't uh, yeah yeah i mean one one description I went and read like some of the studies that he cites oh, good for you. and reading like some of the kind of the testimonials people had and one example this guy had he was dying and uh, and he said you know he, he said it's sort of like um, let's say you have uh, you you're living paycheck to paycheck and you've got like in your savings you've you've got maybe like two thousand dollars in in your in your account that that's your whole kind of savings so Mm -hmm. you're really kind of worried about getting like a bill or some sort of unexpected like expense which could like wipe you out and you're you're worried about that two thousand dollars and what could happen Uh, and then let's say you suddenly like find out that you some uncle you didn't know like just like died and and left you you like ten million Mm dollars right well now um, you like your job, you're going to keep working, but you're not afraid about losing your job anymore. And at $2,000, you're not afraid about like losing that mm-hmm. because you just mm-hmm. feel like I see. there's this thing that's so much bigger that that makes these like worries no longer something I need to... He said it was similar to that, was doing the... was tripping on this drug. He suddenly saw... He just thought... You got $10 million. It's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Everything's going to be fine, and I'm not so worried about yeah. losing yeah. this. When it happens, it yeah. happens, and that'll be that'll be okay. It sounds a lot like uh, ancient philosophical goals. Um, take Stoicism, for example. Yeah. Taking the cosmic perspective in Marcus Aurelius, or uh, let's just take Marcus Aurelius, because yeah. I just give a monologue about that, and, and I know that uh, you're a fan of Marcus Aurelius as well, mm-hmm. and Stoicism more generally. That sounds a lot like it. And the, the temptation is to think that, oh, instead of going through all of this training that the ancient philosophers thought we had to go through, all we have to do is take mushrooms. Well, I mean, with, with Seneca or Epictetus or, or, or Marcus, there is like, they're constantly put, pushing these thought experiments, like imagine losing this. Yes. You know, imagine losing this and then ramp it up yes. so that you're just as blasé about losing yeah. your kid as losing your cup and yes, breaking stuff like that. Yes, that's right. So, but that's always that's always a thought experiment, and thought experiments are, you know, results may vary. It, it depends on how 
how much of a, an imagination you have. Mm -hmm. People who have very vivid, vivid imaginations, mm -hmm. um, I think thought experiments, stoic thought experiments mm -hmm. can be really yes. effective with them because they can actually feel it. Yeah. They can feel it. They can like sort of almost like a method actor. They can like get into character when they're thinking about it and they can really be there yes. and that can benefit. But I think those people are rare. Mm -hmm. I think most people don't have uh, very powerful imaginations, vivid imaginations. So it's always just a lip service. It's always just like it's a they, they don't actually when they when they face the real thing, it's they're going to find that the thought experiments did not help them very much at all. Yeah. So I think what what Paulin is saying with uh, regard to like these these trips is that you're having the experience of it and it's vivid and it's emotional it's yes. visceral it's yes. phenomenological you're really really in it yeah and so when you come out of that you have a you have a kind of a confidence in your ability to deal with this yeah that is far more real right than just a, a thought experiment it's like in the yeah. in in the matrix when the guy is you know talking to the he says i know this steak is not real and that this is just but i don't care this tastes so good right <laughs> like when you're in a situation that's so real uh, it's almost like if somebody tells you that it's not real it's well i'm still experiencing this yeah, yeah. right so it's yeah. uh yeah and it's not an, an either or so well first i want to say the, the the friend i i'm cultivating in, in pittsburgh who is part of this plant medicine community when i mentioned this well, let me just back up. So I teach Plotinus regularly, and Plotinus, of all the ancient philosophers, is in Greece at any rate, is most explicit about the spiritual journey away from everyday experience towards union with God, let's say, the one. And in his version of Platonism, this is a heavily intellectual journey. One must do philosophy uh, to get there. But it's ultimately not a philosophical experience that you're aiming towards. It's union with the one. And the question that I posed years ago when I taught this was, what if there were a pill that you could take that would get you to that union with the one and you would be saved all of this intellectual labor? What problem would Plotinus have with that? And I, I posed this to my friend who's part of this plant medicine community. And she said, well, it, it doesn't work like that, actually. If people just take the pill, they're going to have a trip. It's going to be interesting but it's not going to take them, at least reliably, to union with one, unless they're in this ritual setting, so that it's not as if you get it for free. You just take this pill. So I don't know what happened at Hopkins. Obviously, if, if I'm remembering the statistic correctly, most of them felt it was the most meaningful experience of their life, yeah. but they weren't just given a pill and then dismissed, you know, go drive home and sit in your, your living room. Uh, in many cases, that would have resulted in, in a bad trip, apparently. They're given some kind of ritual setting, and I gather that the point of a good ritual setting is to add something like what Plotinus is saying philosophy gives you. Namely, the goal is this experience, this vivid, you're calling it imagination. Uh, for him, it would be real as well yeah. as an experience. Uh, that, but that philosophy is there to direct you to the right point. In other words, so that you know, if you're getting close, you don't veer off and have a bad trip. <laughs> mm -hmm. this, this is the most reliable way to get there, seems to me. But of course, this is what I want to say earlier, it's not an either or. You, you, if, if these medicines really do enhance that journey, terrific. And if the philosophical intellectual component directs it and enhances or the ritual setting for those who are not inclined to philo philosophy, uh, why not both? Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's a tough one. I mean, just what you were saying about the, the resistance that people have to, to taking a pill or a drug to get, I, I think a lot of that really smacks of kind of protestant work ethic mm, it's like yeah. it's like you, i gotta earn it <laughs> you've got to earn it like you have to if it yeah. doesn't hurt you yes. you don't deserve I it i think somehow. you're right about that and people want you know they're like well you i had to work so hard to get to here how come you can do it just yeah, with like right. a trip or with right. like some experience i mean that's i am I'm, I'm worried I, i'm not crazy about that i right? think that's a good point yeah. yeah but in terms of these these experiences if you are sheltering your kid the way you see an, an archangel mm -hmm. and not giving them kind of access to that right it's it means that they're going to have less of the the full range of experiences right and they're not going to have that kind of toughness and that ability to deal with with adversity right and that's and that that is actually that would be kind of bad parenting right yeah i mean and that seems like 
that's happening very yeah. often. Right? And we are, and this is all, this all should be put within the context that, uh, you know, Johan Hari's book, like Lost Connections and things like that. We are right now in the midst of an epidem epidemic of anxiety and depression among young people. So this is, all of our discussion mm -hmm. needs to be put yeah. on our back. So at the time when safety culture is at its height, yes, more teenagers are committing suicide than ever before. Uh, they are, there's huge, a lot of them are having really serious anxiety. So it's not working, yeah. right? In the most basic sense, it's like, mm. you know, if you're, if you advocate the, the war on drugs, like I was talking to somebody who's really in favor of it uh, last week. And if you're really in favor of the war on drugs, you should at least be able to see that in the United States, uh, the price of drugs, uh, illegal drugs has gone down and the quality has gone up. So it's not working. Like your stated goals are mm -hmm. to kind mm -hmm. of reduce mm -hmm. the stuff. You, it's not working, right? So if our stated goal is to keep our kids as safe as possible, to we're failing. Well, the, I'm just going to play devil's advocate. Not, yeah. I'm not disagreeing with you. But the epistemological problem is that w we might be feeling worse if we didn't have a safety culture. Yeah. So it, is the safety culture the cause of this epidemic, or is it this is the best reaction we have to this thing that's being caused by something else? That's a really good question. I don't uh, – I'm not sure. I mean, I, I asked – I've asked a number of guests this, like in the last – probably the last um, five or six episodes this has come up every single – I mean, I know with Daniel Weinstock, uh, who you, you met last night, yeah. uh, when he was on the podcast recently, we talked about this quite a bit, and he said – Look, uh, we know that it's happening. We've looked at the data from a number of different countries. It's happening in a lot of countries. It's mm -hmm. happening in South Korea. It's happening in Japan. It's mm -hmm. happening in Europe. It's happening in North America. It's even starting to happen in Latin America now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, We know that anxiety is way up and depression is way up, and especially among young people. We also know that young people, there's like, uh, like what they call the sex recession that's happening right mm -hmm. now. Young people are having like very little sex. Like they they're, they're having sex later, and, and then when they start, they're having less of it. So there's and and some countries it's gotten crazy. Like in Japan, yeah. something like I can't remember the percentage. Like fifty percent of Japanese uh, men who are uh, like uh, are like thirty years old are virgins. Like they've never been in an intimate relationship with anybody. Like so, this is a really kind of big deal, right? Mm -hmm. So. I said, so what's the the cause of it? And he said, we just don't know. Yeah, it's so. He's like, we don't. There's there's got to be like a bunch of different factors that are contributing to it, but we don't actually. Yeah. Yeah. There's a. So no, I don't think the safety culture is, is uh, necessarily the, the only reason for this. It's not causing all of this stuff. Yeah. yeah but it doesn't seem like it's helping at all. Yeah, it's not doing enough at any rate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but. So what do you think the – what is the response? Like how do we kind of if, – if Archangel is like a cautionary tale, mm. like this is this is a don't do this, right? Then how do we move away from that? Like what do we – how do we create more sort of resilient, anti-fragile kids? Oh, God, I wish I had the answer to that. I mean the reason why I'm, I'm balking at giving an answer as much as I'd like to be able to is something you said earlier – about how we raise kids in a culture. So when I think about this problem on a day-to-day -day basis with my own children, which I do, even if I would want to do certain things for them, it's just not possible. So as I mentioned earlier, I wish that they could, you know, let's say, walk to school. But first of all, uh, they, the school's too far away because of the way schooling works in, in my city. And, um, you know, if they did... They might be apprehended along the way because kids that young aren't supposed to be walking. Yeah, and you know, and it gets to play playing too. That when I grew up, um, at least the neighborhood that I grew up in, which didn't seem unusual, was such that you know I had five or six friends within walking distance of my house. So my parents could just open the door and I could wander down to someone's house, say, "Do you want to play?" And then yes or no, and if no, I go to the next house. That just isn't the case anymore, I guess. You know, there's still kids out there, so I'm not sure why my kids aren't befriending kids in my neighborhood. I think, again, because of schooling, that their friends are all over the city and go to a particular school. So, you know, I would like them to be playing in that way, but I can't make it happen because of the culture. And yeah. the, that's the, the such compromise. an important point that's, that's often forgotten that you're, 
your kids are being raised. It's by a village. It's, it's kind of an it's an arrogance to think that somehow you are right. totally the one that's in control and is deciding this stuff. I mean, I, I've mm-hmm. seen this in various ways. I've seen parents that I know that are very, very deeply religious and in, in and very quite conservative, and they move to let's say like a very liberal area for work or something like that. And they think that somehow they can raise mm. their kids according to their values. Right, but right. the thing is, is Good luck. if if they're in a place where most of their friends are a certain way and that's kind of the, the prevailing norms, mm-hmm. those kids are going to, most of them are going to end up with those values, right? And if they don't end up with those values, they're going to feel really disconnected from their peers and they're going to feel like kind of a freak and they're yeah, not going right. to have they're going to have issues in that respect yeah. right and right. i've seen the opposite uh this this woman that i went to grad school with like hopkins with her parents were these very very kind of progressive liberal v- uh, kind of intellectual artistic very kind of very sophisticated kind of parents british parents who uh took took a job in texas uh like a teaching job in texas both of them and they thought they could raise their kids according to <laughs> according to like with like horseback yeah. lessons and right. cello lessons. Oh, horseback would be all right. In and Texas. like they could <laughs> wrong know, style raising them to like classic. Yeah, no popular music allowed in the right. house and right. classic. And the end result is she she uh, it was her and her brother. Um, her brother just completely sort of went native, so to speak, and speaks with a thick Texas drawl and drives a pickup truck. And doesn't yeah. like any like he basically assimilated yes. to the culture yes. there. What did the daughter do? Uh, the daughter, the she was like the kid, the unbelievably like tiger mom t- type kid, where she was. She speaks with like almost like it sounds like a little bit of a British accent. Yeah, like and she just felt like a complete alien mm. in Texas, mm. and people treated her like a snob, and mm. she felt excluded all the time and so she she had a really rough time yeah uh, growing growing up there so yeah i mean the culture raises your kids too and so if you think you're gonna be able to uh, swim upstream completely uh, you're probably not going yeah. to be yeah. successful yeah. you need to that's why you, you kind of have to have to some extent a community of like-minded to parents who are going to they're going to have like we have if I look at like the other the parents of our, our kids' friends, mm-hmm. they all have like roughly similar values within a certain spectrum. Mm-hmm. So there's uh, that definitely makes it much easier. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got the wind at your back. I don't feel as if we're kind of going against any kind of norms in any big way. Yeah, but it would be hard. Like if if I lived, for instance, if I lived in a place where let's say most parents were really dis- disapproved of homosexuality, let's say, yeah. so that it would be like not cool with them at all. Uh, that would be like a different, very different experience trying to parent. Yeah. If you're telling your kids that's totally cool, that's totally fine, um, and then they're hearing from their peers, whereas yeah. we just don't have that You know, growing up in yeah. the middle of Montreal – this is not an issue right. at all. Yeah, you, you've got to. I, I have this problem because my kids go to a Catholic school, and I disagree with you know, that issue, for example, among others. And you've got two problems. You've got the fact that you're going to be giving them different values from what they're getting at the school, but then you also have to rise above that particular and have a, a meta discussion with them about different values. <laughs> in other words, they become aware. I mean, this happens in split households, too, with different parents. Um, mm-hmm. you know, but... You, your kids have to kind of grow up a little too fast, I think, and start thinking about, let's call them epistemological issues, mm-hmm. namely, where are they in relation to these different communities and how are they going to start defining themselves? And that's, of course, a very important part of maturation, but it can it can happen too early. They, I think they get overwhelmed. So, again, it's it's a question of you know infinite complexity and discernment on a daily basis of what are you going to talk about, what are you not going to talk about. So I'm dealing with this with... Um, my kids with transgender issues because they're becoming aware of this and uh, they're familiar with somebody who's transgender but they go to a Catholic school that has very rigid dress code for boys and girls. And so I talk to them about, well, here are 
the era of the school's values when it comes to this, and I don't even know that transgender has become an issue yet at my school, but of course it's simmering as it, as it, as it will be all across uh, this culture if it's not being explicitly discussed, it's simmering. And you know, I want them to be aware of it. I want them to hear my perspective. I, I gotta be careful here when I say respect the culture of the school. In other words, I don't want to disparage the whole school because then the kids will think, well, why are you sending me there? And I am sending mm -hmm. them there deliberately for, I think, good reasons. But you know, they've got to learn to navigate the, those complexities, the difference between this culture, this culture, my, my, my father's culture, my mother's culture, my friend's culture, and so on. That's part of growing up. It's just, but it's a question of titrating it. You know, I, yeah. I talk to the six-year-old differently than I talk to the nine-year-old. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the first response that they have is they imagine um, that the way things are done in their household is the way it's done everywhere, yeah. right? And then you gradually realize, oh, people do things differently, yeah. and then cultures do things differently, and you, you, you kind of expand out from there, yeah. right? Uh, but, but, yeah, it's, it's at first, there's a kind of like, what? Uh, yeah. You know, they don't understand it. So I think I have an answer to your question. Let me, I'm going to do it in a roundabout way. Your question that was sticking in my craw that I really wanted to be able to answer, which is how should we respond to the archangel problem? Yeah. So I'll go back to the episode for the moment. And what is the archangel problem? If I had to summarize it, it, it would be with one scene. That's when shortly after the girl, Sarah, harms herself, it's the next scene, the mother, Marie, takes Sarah to a psychologist. And the psychologist shows the, the girl... So um, they're not Rorschach tests. They're pictures of people in, in interactions, and we only see one of them. But the two guys in the picture are obviously hitting each other. They're in a fist fight. Mm -hmm. And the psychologist asks the girl, uh, what are they doing? And she says, they're talking. <laughs> <laughs> and what, you know, for better or for worse, what that's dramatizing is that she's emotionally stunted. She has not been able to acquire a full emotional repertoire, even recognition of what's going on in human interactions, because difficult human interactions have been pixelated for her. So she, yeah. she's missed a skill. And you referred to my acquaintance with attachment theory. I can't remember that we talked about it. I'm not surprised we talked yeah. about so many things over the last year. But, um, you know, take the... Uh, the Russian orphans from the 90s who, who came over. I mean, something I kept hearing was that some of those uh, kids were raised in such deprived environments before they were adopted by American and, and Canadian families that they missed a crucial developmental stage. And this was studied by psychoanalysts in the 50s. Spitz is the name of the analyst who studied orphans during the, the war, mm -hmm. Second World War, who were raised in giant orphanages because their parents had been killed and, you know, or they were uh, sent out of the city and being raised by very few people because of the, the stress on all the resources for the entire nation, they didn't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one parental care and were basically abandoned. They were given food and water. They were given a warm enough you know, bed to sleep in at night, but they weren't given the kind of emotional, rich interactions that this sh study showed you need. And if you don't get it at a certain point, you can never get it. It's, it's a very f a small window. I forget the exact years, but you know, let, let's just make up a number for the moment, three to six or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get that kind of mirroring parent figure who sees what you're feeling and can report back to you what you're feeling, if not with words and with an appropriate reaction, then once that window closes, once that door closes, you're not going back. You're not getting it. And so that, as I recall, was a problem in the 90s was these – Russian orphans were coming over, they're being raised by parents who were trying to mirror their emotions, so I'm realizing I'm not making any progress. And mm -hmm. um, my vague memory of the, the circumstance was that they were having to learn that, okay, they're never going to have this s intuitive skill at reading people. Yeah. You're going to have to teach them techniques for how to read people. It's always going to be a second language for them. And that's the problem I think that's dramatized in that little scene, is that Sarah is just not able to see how people are interacting. She just missed that stage. So when you asked me, what, what can we do about the archangel problem? I, my first answer was, I don't know. It's a huge cultural problem, and I, I want to stick with that. But when it comes to raising particular kids, which is you know what I expect the listeners are, are thinking about, because who can change the culture? We can only affect our kids at most. Uh, I just, if I have one goal in, in reference to this problem, it's that when I raise my kids, I want to make sure they've got an emotional vocabulary that they can recognize those kinds of interactions, and they know how to respond to those. So it's going to mean all kinds of compromises, like play dates instead of going into the forest, like getting driven to school instead of walking to school or taking the bus or whatever. But as long as I get a sense that they are able to recognize from me and my interactions or from a picture that that's t fighting and not talking or, or vice versa, then I think things are going to be okay. They've got the resources on their own t to keep maturing. And if they're not able to do that, and I, I can't think of 
anything at the moment where I, I felt like they weren't able to do that, but they're probably micro episodes like that. Then, you know, then it's time to sit them down or it's time to think about an activity that will encourage them to do that or to think about how we've changed the household routine so that, so that they get more of that. Mm. Well, that, that, that's very similar to what, you know, what Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff, what they say in, in their recommendations okay. at the end of The Coddling of the American Mind, where they say that uh, one of the recommendations is that kids need to have more unstructured time okay. where yes. they're not like where the, it's not scheduled. I they can't completely. be going from like, you know, soccer to piano lessons. Yep. To like, like they can't be just. Yep. High, so they have to have unstructured time. Um, and then also they have to have more time where they're with their peers mm -hmm. and they're not under supervision where they can yeah. like hang out with their peers. Yeah. And a lot of that will sort of, they'll learn things. They'll acquire emotional intelligence through their kind yes. of, kind of negotiations of those relationships that yes. are not being micromanaged by, yes. by adults intervening. It's like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in, in Emile, where he says like the lessons that children learn in the schoolyard are infinitely more uh, valuable than the lessons they learn in the classroom. Yeah. Right. So, the, giving them more of an option because right now, you know, I'm sure you've seen this. Like, you'll go to these like these play dates or these birthday parties, and there's like a couple parents just hovering, like behind, ooh, just like, <gasps> like. Do you want another just, piece of pizza? Yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you like? <laughs> oh, are you okay? Like, just, yeah. just totally like hovering, and yeah. it, as soon as there's any kind of conflict between. Right. Two kids like swooping in right. and kind of micromanaging it and yeah. saying like, oh, now you say you're sorry. Like yeah. doing all this right. stuff. And it just, it's really, really. The kids don't manage to, they don't learn how to manage conflict on their own. No, they don't. They don't le learn how to like manage that stuff. And they also, it's its anxiety producing. Right. right? It's like that, uh, have you ever watched like Cesar Milan, the uh, the dog whisperer. Um, yeah, that was like 15, 20 years ago. But sure, I watched. Yeah, a couple but you ever like? I, I, I loved that show. Okay. I thought it was just absolutely. That is, I thought that was the show that would best prepare you for child for <laughs> being parented for being a parent. Because like what he said that you know when you see a really bad, like badly behaved dog, mm. it's always the owner's fault. Mm. And so one of the things he said, if you're really anxious, mm. if you're really anxious, I see. It, they'll pick up on that and it makes them really anxious mm -hmm. and so if very often like when a, a dog barks when another dog it's because you're getting really nervous and so that makes them think oh this is a threat and so they start like barking yeah. whereas if you're very nonchalant about it yeah they'll be like oh this is a friend and they'll just yeah. greet the other dog yeah. or the yeah. other person yeah. without a problem right yeah i have to say when i watched that show 20 years ago i you know the few episodes i saw it seemed persuasive uh, I had a dog growing up. It was a very obedient dog. We, you know, we trained the dog, and it, it was a collie, so the dog was, you know, genetically disposed to being obedient. They're shepherd dogs. And in the meantime, I've gotten a dog who's now quite old. Uh, it was a terrier. Not trainable. <laughs> Terriers are just very different. They're there to be wandering a alone around the, the farmyard and pursuing rodents. That's why they're, yeah. they're called terriers. They go to ground, as opposed to the collie who's out in the field with the master who's following precise commands about how to shepherd the sheep. Yeah. This is my uh, taste of parenting before I ever had kids because I came away from that uh, experience with my colleague thinking it's up to the owner. In other words, agreeing with, with Cesar Milan that mm -hmm. you know, if you have a bad dog, it's because you're a bad parent uh, owner. If you've got a good dog, it's because you're a good owner. And, and then my dog was very good, and I was very proud. And when I saw badly behaved dogs out in public, I thought, bad, bad owners. Yeah. Since I've had a terrier, I realized, just as I have with parenting, They've got their natures. There's really not much you can do. Make sure they don't harm each other. Make sure they don't harm e uh, themselves. And you know, the, the or the or the kids. My yeah. uh, my wife's parents have a terrier, and the dog is just, and it's like probably the worst dog I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. I mean, this dog like has bit. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, like almost like bit Tristan's nose. Like to, had he had to go oh, and get like yeah. We had to go to the emergency room when oh. he was little. How's that friendship doing? Uh, he, he's <laughs> this dog has bit. Like uh, my father-in-law, right, right through the hand, oh. has bit like lots of. It. It's oh. just a terrible, terrible yeah. dog. Yeah. And when we looked into it, sure enough, terriers. They say they're just they're very, very difficult dogs to have, and they say you shouldn't have them around kids. They they're they're just very wired, kind of like little crazy beings. Yeah, yeah right? they're fun. So, I mean, if you keep them within certain bounds, they're delightful dogs. Yeah, they're like little jokesters. But they, but but. they basically. I get your point. They have their nature, right? And you can't just you can't deny their their nature. It's just like people who 
you know, the big pit bull like defenders. They're like, oh, it's it's all just you know the right. owner's fault if right, they bite right, somebody. Right. Like, well, they're terriers, pit bulls. Yeah, and so essentially, like pit bulls have their nature. They were bred to be fighting dogs and to do certain things, and so those tendencies were were ramped up over time through selective yeah. breeding, and you can't act as if. Right. You know, there's a reason why, like, a lab is a, just an unbelievably chill dog. Right. Like, they they made them that way, right? <laughs> and there's a reason why terriers are wired and yeah. crazy and yeah. jumpy and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. 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 You can't you can't forget those things. But the episode. Yeah. So as you know, I know you teach this. Uh, we kind of talked about all the things that you want to talk about in Archangel. I've kind of covered a lot of the questions that I wanted to ask you. Are there questions that you want to ask me, or that you want things in in the episode that you want to talk about that we haven't addressed? Uh, well, just going back to the the original point, which is the the notion of of faith, right? And I I think what the the episode gets at is the the absolute necessity that we we're always told through technological means or things like that that somehow we can overcome the problem of of trust, mm. right? That we can because technology makes it so that you don't have to trust because you have proof, yes. right? But there's always this. There's a gap that we have to, in order to have like really meaningful relationships with each other, we have to trust people. And when you trust people, that means that they can let you down. They can lie to you. They can deceive you. They can. But that's part of the mix, and you can't escape that, mm -hmm. right? And I remember I, I always sort of think back to this a few years ago. There's a philosophy department here in Montreal. They were having a, a fundraiser for something, the student association, and they were selling these jerseys. And the, on the front of the shirt, it said, "Question everything." Yeah, right. Philosophy department. Right, right. And I remember thinking, "Oh, that's so cute." <laughs> I remember <laughs> believing that was possible. But the thing is, is you can't question everything because we just don't have enough time. Yeah, we don't or, have enough. Or mental... question, question everything. <laughs> yeah, like we we actually we have limited time and mental resources, and so in order to get through life yeah you have to trust lots of people for right. many many different things i mean even if it's just driving down the highway you have to trust that that people aren't going to veer into your lane and have a head-on collision with you yeah. it can actually happen yeah right and people who've been in a, a bad car accident they often yeah. they're, they're so scared because they remember that that they will have difficulty driving, yeah. right? I think you'll like this, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, when I was at McGill as an undergrad, and I was in my junior year, I remember particularly, I read Wittgenstein. I really loved Wittgenstein, who's basically a, a skeptic. I think he's basically a sexist empiricist for the 20th century. But it's the skepticism that made a big impression on me. And I found myself in the month of the, the first month of the summer when I went back home that I would come to an intersection. And even though my light was green and the lights in the opposite direction were red, I thought... Why should I? I don't know that the person coming the other direction is gonna tr is gonna stop for the red light, and so I actually found myself <laughs> slowing down to the to the green light to the point that people behind me were were honking, and it was it's an illustration of how skepticism can get you in trouble. I could get smashed from behind because yeah. I wasn't trusting of the intersection. Yeah, and it but it, it applies to relationships even way more than even oh, than, tra than yeah. traffic. Yes, that if you are, uh, if you let's say you take somebody that's been in a really a bad relationship where somebody cheated on them like a lot and really kind of just abused their trust and was doing all sorts of yeah. right then very often um they'll be really kind of paranoid in their next relationship and they'll be saying i want your passwords i want to yeah. and they'll be super jealous yes and that intense jealousy and will turn the person off and it will like kind of sour that relationship which will be a self-fulfilling prophecy because now they'll think oh you know yeah exactly people don't treat me well exactly right and so this this can become i mean this sort of the extreme case that i think of you know like the worst case scenario is i uh, that woman paula raider who's that uh, yeah, paula raider was the wife of one of the most famous serial killers in american history the btk killer right and he killed all of these people they were married for i don't know like like something like 30 years 40 years she had no idea she slept in next to this guy in bed mm. he was the president of church council yeah. at their lutheran oh. church i just got he, a chill uh, and he was doing this and he got away with it for decades but one of the things that he would do was uh, he would kind of taunt the police so every once in a while he would write them 
a letter saying you still haven't got me and he would say like some detail yeah of one of the killings that would prove that he actually yeah. was the person yeah. who did it yeah. and they hadn't caught him and then some bright person in the police department decided hmm maybe what we should do is post like post the because they were handwritten letters oh, and see if somebody yeah. recognizes the yeah. handwriting yeah and one of the guys daughters recognized her oh, father's can you imagine handwriting that feeling yeah and anyway but i imagine like if you're uh this woman paula Rader, like you've been happily married they had perfectly had a great marriage. you've been happily married to this guy for a decade you've been sleeping next to him every night and he did these horrible things and he did a lot of them in your house mm. like the amount of you know breaking your trust in the world and yeah. your faith in yeah. the world yeah i mean how could how somebody do you like that? that how could you ever trust anybody yeah. because you'd think you know what i have the worst judgment ever how could i have been so stupid that i didn't yeah. see this yeah right how could i have been like you see beat yourself up about it. i'm such an idiot how can i ever trust not only other people but how can i trust my own judgment yes in the future yes but the thing is is if you actually uh, are going to to live in the world and have meaningful connections with other people you have to take that risk yeah you have to in, in the full knowledge that it it could happen yeah. like you could get totally screwed over you could and so i guess the uh, one of the best lessons we can impart to our kids and i'm not exactly sure how you may i guess you do that largely just by showing in in the way that you are in the world but is to impart to them that uh, love is worth it you know, trust is worth it. Mm -hmm. um, friendship is worth it, but it always requires, there's risk. Yeah. Right. So every time you, you rely on people and you trust people, uh, you perhaps move away from autokaya, you move away from like self sufficiency, yeah. but it's worth it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why I asked you about autokaya because it's clearly something we want in our children. We want them to be self sufficient, but it's also a danger. It can become a defense against intimacy. Yeah. Well, I wrote this. I wrote this poem uh, to my wife soon after we met, and it was like me kind of wrestling with that. And my my uncle Peter actually read it at our wedding. It was one of the readings, but it was uh, it was sort of because at the time I was really heavily involved in stoicism, and I was mm -hmm. really trying to mm -hmm. achieve like like self sufficiency, yeah. right? And I wanted that, right? And I wanted to kind of move away from like the wheel of samsara and to transcend fear and desire as much as possible and and find like that that quiet place within myself where nothing can touch you right and then you, you fall in love and you become like really really vulnerable yes and there's all these things uh, and the the poem involves to some extent uh, me kind of having a an argument with buddha and marcus aurelius right yes. and so it's saying like uh you know like to you and, and and then talking to to Annalisa and saying like you know I you know Atarkea self sufficiency the philosopher's ideal has exited stage left along with my Libra and keel take my free will for I wish to be your predestined fool uh, you know like and then sort of addressing Marcus to realize and like oh you know stop your take the, wipe that disapproving look off your face Marcus yeah uh, you know you and uh, you and Buddha missed something that you know the romantics yeah, have always known. Yeah, yeah. A losing game it is, fleeing from fear and desire. For if you win, what have you won? Yeah. Right. So, like, if you actually manage to to transcend these things, is that necessarily such a great thing? I mean, if if you're in yeah. a horrible amount of pain, you've just been in a very bad car accident, then yes, feeling nothing is a, a great thing, right? Whether you can do it through mental exercise. Uh, you know, like those Buddhist monks that sit there and lotus position and light themselves on fire. Like mm -hmm. if you're in a, a great deal of pain, then that kind of detachment, whether it's done through pharmacologically or through spiritual practice or mental practice, I can see the advantage of that. But if you are living a basically, you know, good life in a Western country, you know, like w what is the real advantage to that kind of detachment? Yeah. Yeah, so well, so many directions to go, John. Yeah. Um, I mean, one is just to take up this last point about Stoicism. Uh, my own interpretation of Stoicism, I'd be interested to see whether we disagree about this, is that apatheia, 
uh, apathy, yeah, uh, not feeling anything, is not the goal. It is the goal for many emotions. They think most emotions are toxic. So, you know, anger, for example, you are upset because you feel that somebody's insulted you. But as I say in, in my monologue that precedes this on my podcast, that's a- always going to involve a, a mistake, a mistaken judgment about who you are. So, you know, if somebody says, you know, you're, you're poor and you feel insulted. Well, those are my possessions. They're not me. So I haven't been insulted. These objects that are surrounding me have been insulted. And the only thing that could really insult me would be somebody criticizing my judgment. And either they're wrong, in which case I shouldn't care, or they're right, in which case I should thank them. So that's just an illustration that most of the emotions the Stoics want to dispense with. But there is at least one, I think, that they want to cherish. And I see this now that I've been attuned to it in Marcus constantly. That is joy. They, they, they love of God, trust in the cosmos, this providential component of Stoicism that's totally missing from cognitive behavioral therapy and the 20th, 21st century appropriations of Stoicism, which I think ruins the whole point of Stoicism, because you get this, I'm going to be indifferent to everything. Um, But rather for Stoicism, it's dispense with these toxic emotions, clear the ground for this joy that you should feel in the the presence of the cosmos. The question is, should you just feel joyous in this abstract sense? Because then what happens when your son dies, or what happens when you parents die or you've been betrayed and so on. There needs to be some middle ground where you're attached to those people. You don't see them as simply checkers in a game, which I think Stoicism, I I don't see the resources in Stoicism for treating particular people as valuable in and of themselves. Instead, they seem to be cultivating this cosmic perspective where you become completely detached, you know, as in Epictetus saying, you know, every time you kiss your son, do so with the thought that today he may die. That's like treating him, as you said earlier, like, like he's just another cup. Mm-hmm. I take a kernel of wisdom in, in Christianity, and I see this in Platonism as well, but let's just talk about Christianity for the moment, to be, continue loving the cosmos, that's what even God in, his, in the person of the Son did, while recognizing that this can happen to you, even when you're God, namely crucifixion. Simultaneously hold together, I'm going to love this, and yet I'm going to pay the highest price, and going in with that attitude that that's likely to happen if I pursue this all the way. Hmm. Well, I guess... I, I see what you're talking about in Marcus, and I, I see that too in a lot of Stoicism and also in a lot of uh, Buddhism. They seem to believe that that joy is the human default, that that is like yeah. you know, the, the, that cheesy, the baseline, that cheesy kind of expression. Of, uh, say you know it's a perfect blue sky, sunny day, all every day of the year. It's just you don't realize uh. that because sometimes there's clouds okay. covering. But, I never heard the cheesy but if line. You get a, <laughs> if you get above the clouds, it's a blue sky. Yeah. It's a perfect, clear, right. sunny day every single day. It, I mean, I never heard the cheesy line, so it doesn't right. seem cheesy to me. It seems yeah. like an insight because you get on a plane in you know rainy Montreal, you get above the clouds. Wow, it's like it's yeah, like it's this. a perfect blue sky, <laughs> sunny day, right? So the 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 Buddhist position and the, the Stoic position, especially with Marcus, I'd say, but. And I'm not so sure about Epictetus, but and also the Epic, Epicureans believe the same thing as well, right? That the human default yes. is joy. Yes, it's the human default is not suffering and it's not neutral. It's not blah. It's not right. boring. The human default is joy. Yes, and the only reason you're not experiencing joy is because you've allowed your consciousness to be clouded by various yes. things and yes. anxieties and fears. So if you can sort of wipe away that those those clouds you're going to have this spontaneous joy. And when you look at, like, the Dalai Lama, or, like, that, that just exuberant, the childish almost exuberant, the giggling, and he's just, like, so happy all the time in this, like, for no reason necessarily, right? And, and Michael Pollan also um, seems to believe in, in how to change your mind that, that hallucinogenics, especially, like, mushrooms, that they also allow you to just experience spontaneous joy and awe about the world that is not related to the fulfillment of any kind of pleasure like it's not because you're eating something really good or you're or you're having sex or you're getting a back massage or you're like it's not related to like kind of any pleasure being satisfied it's just spontaneous joy at existence and mm-hmm. consciousness mm-hmm. right i'm very attracted to this idea because it accords with my own personal experience i feel very much like my default experience of the world is joy i i f- find sometimes i just be like giggling <laughs> like i'm just like <laughs> standing on a street corner and i'm just just loving just being oh. alive and being like 
So for me, I find that is uh, to be very true. My problem with the Buddhists and with the Stoics and with this idea is that I've I've talked to another enough other people in the world mm -hmm. to who've told me this is not true. No. Even when I clear away that stuff, my default is not joy. My default is to to be like really nihilistic to that if I clear away all of my concerns of the day, mm -hmm. what I find is just this incredibly cold, meaningless world. And so if I don't have my fears and my anxieties, mm -hmm. I have just kind of nothingness. Right. Like right. This or even bleak. worse, clear it all away and then there's a feeling that this this cosmos is hostile to me. Yeah. And or that or that too. That so for some people it seems like their default is yeah. is actually uh, a kind of nihilism or their default is is hostile and finding yeah. like the to be unhappy. Kind of terror. Yeah. yeah. To be like very that's and I think you know when I listen to for instance Jordan Peterson, um it seems very clear to me that mm. his default is mm. a very, very dark, mm. black place mm -hmm. where he is filled with terror and mm -hmm. the unknown, and it's horrible. And so it takes a great deal of kind of work and and medication for a lot of his life to basically to be able to overcome that, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look at you know people like Jordan Peterson and many people I've known like this, I just think that the the stoic prescription is almost like mean yeah it's you know, it's mean it's like i can listen to those teachings yeah and follow them and i get you know the works properly right but there's other people who can follow those and it's not going to work for them right and and, and actually might make things much worse yeah. it's like having a terrier and you know, <laughs> it's a bratty and like you're everybody's judging you for yeah like your right. dog sucks but right. like yeah my dog's nature is just really difficult and so i don't know if it would work yeah uh, for everybody have you thought more about the way in which in, in your case your particular attitude and these other people you're talking about that those differences can be traced to parenting styles I'm, and I'm sure it's a nature nurture question as well. But the reason I bring it, especially to parenting styles, is because we're talking about Archangel and the the damaging parenting style that Marie uses ag against, I say against Sarah in this instance. So you know, I'm not inviting you unless you want to to be more revealing about your own upbringing. But have you noticed when you talk to those people that, in your case, you felt there was a secure attachment, and I, I would say from what I know of you, to your mother, for example. And, and then those friends that you're talking about, you know, were they in abusive households, for example? I mean, people who come out, let me just say as a, as a tangent, people who come out of abusive households and yet have this attitude of the cosmos loves me and, and you know, as long as it's genuine and, and not a defense, that is, that is to me remarkable. Well, I think a lot of it is probably, is probably genetic. I mean, this is uh, Jonathan Hyde in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, mm -hmm. he, he talks about this and he says that, um, Yes, uh, your upbringing matters, um, and it definitely ha it definitely has an effect. Mm -hmm. But he says also there's some people who just won the cortical lottery. Yeah, like their brain just happens. Their their default. Is, yeah, and he says it's sort of like a a person that they have the the thermostat is set to twenty one, right? So if things for get, the American listeners, that's yeah, what <laughs> sixty eight seventy. Yeah, like so they, they their thermostat is set to like to a nice comfortable yeah. room temperature and so if things get uh, get too cold the heat goes on to bring them back right. to 21 right. if things get too hot the air conditioning goes on to bring mm -hmm. so they they their sort of default mode is a pretty comfortable state and they some people who did not yeah. win the cortical lottery yeah their default is like too you know, hot too cold if 14 degrees celsius or yeah. something like that like their default is is cold yeah right so they're always trying to you know account for that to to change that yeah. right and this is something that is is f there from a very early age like i for instance okay one of my um one of my my half brother uh committed suicide um a few years ago and uh, it's bit more, I, it was very very uh upsetting and we have the same father different different mothers and uh, at his at his funeral afterwards, I was talking to 
uh, to some of his to his family. And I was talking to actually his his grandmother, um, so his you know his mother's mother, um, and she was saying you know like uh, she said I knew you me. Um, mm-hmm. She said you know I knew you. I hadn't seen I didn't know that I had known her, but I actually knew her when I was a little little kid. Okay, and she said you know like uh, I could tell when the two of you were like two years old yeah it, when you were really really young mm-hmm. i looked at you and i just knew even though this was kind of a difficult home situation and mm-hmm. i'm not going to mm-hmm. go into it mm-hmm. but i she goes i knew like at the age of like two that you were going to be completely fine yeah just absolutely fine uh, and because you just were just this like really happy-go-lucky kid you're happy you're like always in a mm-hmm. and you just seemed you know, very, and then I, I knew, and it was painful because this mm. is my grandson. I knew, looking at your brother, that he was going to have a hard time. Mm. Yeah. I just knew, like you could see it from that age that yeah. uh, he just was very anxious mm-hmm. and very like, you know, fraught. Like his his default was not joy. It was. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was a very unhappy person. Like, for oh. For his life, he's he had a very very difficult time. Yeah, of it. Sorry to hear that. So it's um, yeah, I guess there there has to be that humility in parenting. Yes. To realize that um, you know, your kids have as, as the Buddhists would say, your kids have their karma, right? They have their karma that they bring into. I mean, I, I don't like buy it, but it's a good way of thinking about it mm-hmm. that they have their karma, and you can't, you're not totally in control. You can't play yeah. God. Yeah. And you can do everything right. Yes. And and they can still end up you know terribly yeah. and you but paradoxically if the kid just happens to have won the cortical lottery you could do everything wrong things will be and fine. they're fine yeah. yeah right so it's uh yeah it's it's very daunting yeah, yeah. so uh, let me let me tell the birth stories of my two kids not not full stories but just allude yeah. to them so first my son i recorded it you know this was 10 years ago so i, I had a cell phone and i, I recorded it and He's, he's brought out and put on uh, his mother's chest, and he looks at the camera. And, you know, you'd have to know my son the way I do. But I can see it's already there. In other words, there's something about him that when he looks right into that camera, it's there. You know, and I, I probably wouldn't be able to express it even if I were to talk about this for 100 years, but I, I have a very strong sense um, that that's true. So that, that really plays into my notion that he's got his nature and mm-hmm. I'm there to make sure he you know, doesn't hurt himself or other people. And that... I'll get back to my daughter in a moment, but um, I want to talk a bit about the archangel scene, the very first one, where S- uh, Marie is giving birth to Sarah. And if you haven't seen the episode, it's a C-section, and we learn that she's tried to give birth naturally, so to speak, and was not able to do it. And she's holding the hand of the nurse and saying, I- I'm sorry, I, you know, I failed, or so- something to that effect. And the nurse is reassuring you, like, you didn't fail, this happens all the time, you tried, and so, so on. It's because it's a C-section, there's a curtain uh, right in the middle, and we don't see this till the end of the scene when the camera rises above the hole, but from, from the top down, you have this distinct contrast between the world below the curtain where you've got this open womb and blood mm-hmm. from which the baby has been removed, and then above the curtain, you have the civilized world, the, the world that she's living in, uh, that she, you know, she can't see the world below, as if to say, here's what life is actually like. <laughs> Here is the illusion of life that, that she has. When the baby is removed, uh, baby doesn't breathe for a while. And I think it's left deliberately ambiguous in that scene, whether there's a problem that they quickly fix or whether it's just a normal birth. And here's the story of my, my second uh, child's birth. My daughter, um, I delivered my daughter <laughs> in the bathtub of our home. This was not intended. Uh, uh, their mother went into labor, and then 10 minutes later, my daughter was crowning. And I called 911, they gave me quick instructions, and I, I reached in, grabbed the ears, and pulled her out. And she squirted across the bathtub that is and wild. Hit, hit the side of the bathtub. And I was afraid, oh, God, I gave her a brain injury you know, in her first seconds of life. Well, she wasn't breathing. She was gray. And I was terrified. What, oh my God, what do I do? And you know, it's all hazy to me. I, you know, I could reconstruct it um, by talking to their mother more and people that I, to whom I told the story at the time. But one of us cleared out the mouth of the liquid and you know patted the baby on the back and she started breathing but this is not unusual in other words babies when they come out they have to adjust to breathing this is a yeah. new thing for them and it's not like they just instantly do it they, they, their cavity is full of 
birth canal fluid and uh, and so on. And so when I see that scene, I remember this experience in my life of terror that my baby's not breathing. Yeah. Uh, that Marie experiences. And that's why for me at least that scene is ambiguous that here's this perfectly normal birth, but she's experiencing it as a terrifying moment because Things aren't going according to plan. Things seem bad. She doesn't have the knowledge to know. In fact, things are things are going just fine. Shoot forward to what many people will not have noticed in this episode, that when Sarah, the daughter's a teen, and she's actually pregnant with um, the baby she's conceived with her boyfriend that her mother learned about before she did because of the monitoring device, her mother gives her a, an abortifacient in the smoothie that if you rewatch the episode, the you'll morning notice, after pill, yeah. Yes, the uh, smoothie is, is quite prominent every morning, and it, it, the different scenes where mornings are portrayed, the, the mother gives her a smoothie as if this is mother's milk. And mm-hmm. at first, it's a kid smoothie, and then uh, when the daughter is you know ten or eleven, it's a smoothie with probiotics, or maybe it's, she's a teen at this point, and there's the, the mother really supervising the child's you know in, in a good way. They have a joke about you know this is a firm your stools or something like that. And then the, the third time that it becomes significant is when she puts in the, the morning after pill. And the daughter doesn't know this, but she's in a class, looks like a literature class in her high school, and the lecturer is talking about Oedipus, Sophocles' Oedipus. And in my podcast, I have a, an entire episode just a couple ago, if you're listening to them in sequence, about the Oedipus story. And I, I probably anticipate this discussion about uh, this, this uh, Black Mirror episode. And the point of contact is... In the Oedipus story, the gods fate Oedipus to kill his father and sleep with his mother. And it's a very complicated story, but just to get to the point here, he, when he learns of this, he tries to avoid that fate. But it's in his effort to avoid it that he brings it about. And I think this is a deliberate conceit of this episode because they have the lecturer talking about Oedipus just in this brief moment. What happens? Well, that first scene... There is Marie, the mother, who becomes terrified of a fate, namely her daughter is going to die because of some negligence on her part. And so she then tries to avoid that fate by supervising her with the smoothies and the probiotics and, of course, the archangel implant. What happens in the end? The daughter abandons her, the very thing that she feared, because the daughter is so enraged, I think justifiably, not that what she does is justifiable, but so enraged by having been deprived of her childhood her normal childhood that she as you know if you've watched the episode it's brutal she she beats her i i thought the first time i saw it to death yes yeah, so did i yeah. so bloody um but the mother eventually revives and runs out and screaming her name into the street exactly as she screamed her name when the daughter got lost in the in the playground which that's the scene that y- you remember as okay that's the traumatizing episode for which the archangel implant is supposed to be a solution but it, it goes all the way back to the birth moment yeah well the it's a weird thing about certain kinds of fears and anxiety. I mean, Freud's really great on this, but like the way in which it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy yes. that like if you're, you know, it's sort of when you're learning how to drive and they tell you, be careful, you know, look at that point in the middle of the road, because if you look at a point on the side, you yes. will naturally start right. veering towards that. That's thing, a good analogy. Right. Yeah. And there's this, this weird thing that when you are really kind of, uh, afraid of a particular thing and trying so hard to to avoid that thing you almost you know, sometimes veer towards it right i mean I, I saw this with just when i was a young man a teenager i was i was so obsessed when i was a, a kid and a teenager i was so obsessed with uh, not being like my father mm-hmm. like i absolutely wanted to be the opposite right. of my father that um that trying so hard to be uh, not like something mm-hmm. I ended up in some respects going to an opposite extreme that was in many ways just as bad you, so, you're captured by that dichotomy yeah and so I, I had to transcend that you know yes. the way that like Nietzsche talks in the prologue to Thus Spoke Zarathustra the, the camel the lion and the, the child like I had to transcend my kind of uh, rebellious yes. like je suis going through kind yeah. of like I had to transcend that so that I could just do yeah my thing right yeah. but you see that it's it's weird in in relationships uh you, like you were, you were saying you know i i see with with my students the the students who have the most conservative repressive parents are the students who overwhelmingly are more than average are lying to their parents 
are are getting pregnant, are mm-hmm. getting like STIs, mm-hmm. are getting in all sorts of trouble. So it's it's like the more that they mm-hmm. they try and like bottle this, the more they they have an opposite reaction, which yes. is strange because if you would think if you are and you see the same thing in the in the United States, I've seen the the maps that the part the the Bible Belt, the places that are most right. religious, yeah. have the highest divorce rates, the highest teen pregnancy right. rates, I've seen those. the high they, they consume the most amount of pornography. So there there is this weird like, kind of return of the repressed yes. that happens, right? Yes. So I mean, with 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 parenting, I just uh, I I don't know what's what's going on there. I mean, maybe it is, uh, you know, what is it? Is it Chris Rock or, you know, Chris Rock? He says like, you know, if you're if you're homophobic, you're gonna have a gay son, right? <laughs> if you're a racist, yeah. Yeah. Uh, guess what? Your daughter's gonna come home language, with yeah. like you're gonna like like whatever you are most yeah uh, kind of against. That's with your kids. That's going to happen. I think you've led me to a deeper answer now to the question that you asked me that I really wanted to answer. And that you asked me, so how do we respond to the archangel problem? First I said, well, it's this cultural thing. There's nothing we can do. And then I said, um, here is how you can help the kids, at least in the the family. But now I I think the the answer I ultimately want to give is you you have to work on yourself. So take Marie. If it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is I think the um, episode is illustrating, it's her anxiety that's really at the root of the problem. She can't handle risk. I mean, you know, she, that's why she freaks out in what seems to be a pretty normal birth. And so if you, you see that Archangel episode and you think, I don't want this to happen to my kids, I don't want this to happen to my relationships, if you want to broaden it out, first thing you have to do is attend to your own anxiety that that might happen. And you have to be able to say, you know, it might, and I'm going to have to be okay with that. And that's very difficult. You need some kind of resources uh, you know, I would call them spiritual resources in the broadest sense. And I think it's thus not a coincidence that our conversation wandered into the psychedelics and into Plotinus and into Christianity and so on, the Stoics. Even though Archangel doesn't have spiritual themes, it's not wearing them on its sleeve. I think that without resources of, of some sort like that, that can put your life into perspective and say, even when these awful things happen, it's going to be okay in the broadest sense. Without that, I don't know that you can manage that anxiety. And if you can't manage that anxiety, you're going to project it onto your relationships and, mm-hmm. and spoil them. And you'll get, yeah, and they'll, I mean, it, it just, you th- take, you remember that show that was popular when we were kids, Family Ties? Yes. And you have like the two hippie progressive parents and yes. they have Alex P. Keaton. Yes. <laughs> who's like, <laughs> so this, 80s, yeah. Which, you know, he has like a, yeah. a poster of Reagan. Nixon on yeah. his wall <laughs> and, and Reagan and he yeah. like, he's super conservative, yeah. right? And like, yeah. th- that dynamic seems to, play out very often the the idea that okay you have really conservative parents and so the Mm -hmm. kid kind of rebels and becomes like you know something else and then you know you have all these so it seems like whatever you're trying really hard to do uh, to some extent the kids are going to push against those limits yeah right so then Choose your limits carefully. Yeah, choose your <laughs> limits carefully. Like I, I mean, the funniest one. I mean, he's he's definitely listening to the podcast. But my friend Jimmy, uh, Jimmy McDonough. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, in Baltimore, he he jokingly he's uh, one of the funniest guys I've ever met in my entire life. He's uh, actually t- Tina Fey in this famous interview she did with uh, with Playboy. The interviewer said, like, you know, when did you decide you wanted to be a comedian? Mm-hmm. And she said, well, there was this guy I went to school with in Philly <laughs> named Jimmy McDonough. <laughs> and he was so funny. It was like a superpower. Yeah. Like he could make the teachers like laugh yeah. hysterically. Yeah. Even the most serious oh, could wow. make the principal, like anybody, like yeah. he could make them laugh. I right? want to find out more about this. But yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> and, uh, and but, but Jimmy was saying like when uh, when his uh, his wife was was uh, expecting their first and and but he said, well, I want my kid to be interesting. And so that way I have to like scare them. And so he said, he goes, I'm <laughs> he's gonna, making me laugh remotely. He's like, he's like, so what I'm going to do is when my kid is young, I'm going to get bear claws and I hide under my kid's bed. And then, and then I go, Whoa, <laughs> with the bear claws. <laughs> and, he said, and so then it'll be interesting because yeah. all the interesting people I know had these like traumatic like right, childhoods. Right. So I'm going to artificially, and I right. remember like the opposite of an archangel. When I was plan. explaining, uh, when I was explaining the, uh, Jonathan Hyde and Greg Lucchiano's thesis to Jimmy, his first response was, oh, come on. This is like my silly bear claws thing. Like, so what? They're going to 
try and like toughen their kids up <laughs> and uh, and all that. He's like, I don't, yeah, you because know, I don't <laughs> buy that. He said, life is gonna hurt you yeah. sooner or later, whether you want to. It's gonna hurt them. One or other. I, I can you know cuddle him for now while he's under my protection. I can do that, and I'm not worried about him. You know, he'll experience plenty of suffering whether I want him to or not. Right, so I I don't need to add to it. Yeah. Right, in some, uh, like, and that was his kind of, which is somewhat similar to the critique you were advancing with them earlier. That like, you know, is this is this really, right? Some people are fragile in certain ways, yeah. and you know why why do you need to like why do you need to kind of exacerbate? Yeah, it? Like, right. Uh, yeah. You had I thought do you had some specific questions, right? We've answered them all. We have. Yes, oh, in wow. our roundabout way, we've answered them awesome. all. Awesome. Well. Uh, do you have any sort of closing remarks? No, any, like, no. I'm really happy about the way that uh, you invited me to think about what the solution is. And, of course, I don't have the solution, but uh, I feel like through this conversation, I've gone deeper in my thinking about the right response to this episode, awesome. at least for me. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Likewise, and since it's yeah, also yeah, mine, thank like you so much for being my first, being a guest for the first time on my show.